Hello and welcome to part two of our introduction to anatomy of Austria-Hungary. Today we are going to be starting from the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867 and carrying on until the death of Franz Josef in, 18, in 1916. As always, very lucky to be joined by Columba and Marcus Fierus Perthnex. Hello. Hello, gentlemen. Good to be here. Indeed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Wonderful. So without further ado, we'll get straight into it. So moving on straight, obviously, we finished the last stream talking about the decisive Austrian defeat at the Battle of Königlitz, whereby the Prussian army was able to decisively defeat the Austrian army and with it gain virtual control over all of the German states. And of course, in aligning with Bismarck's overall plan for Germany. He does not demand any annexations of Austrian territory. He is opting for a lesser Germany, a Klein Deutschland, which would exclude Austria and the German-speaking Austrian regions to as further increase Prussian hegemony. And so Austria is territorially preserved. And is, but that, it's... Um, is that primarily a religious consideration? No, it's it's more of a localized. I mean, the, I've always contended on many of the other streams that we've done that German unification for Bismarck was a form of Prussian hegemony over Germany rather than German unification for the sake of German unification. You already have the religious questions. So when we have the unification of Germany, there are special allowances given over to the principal Catholic kingdom in the south, Bavaria, which has, you know, virtual autonomy, its own army, etc. It's also pretty much the second most powerful state apart from Prussia, right? And Austria, yes. But when it comes to Austria, it's not just a religious issue. It's also the fact that adding all of these extra territories would have, you know, fundamentally changed the whole balance of power in Europe and would have potentially invited a Russian intervention to stop the Prussians expanding so much in the way of territory at the expense of Austria. So Austria was needed for long-term foreign policy considerations for Prussia and also because Germany had no Prussia had no desire to expand into Austria and therefore lose influence in a basically a scheme of greater Germany. So as a result, the um, the ancient conception of the, the German Confederation, which included Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, Austria, etc., was undone. And we have the reformation of a North German Confederation, which excludes the southern states and it excludes Austria, albeit the southern states are part of this alliance pact that will become involved in the Franco-Prussian War. However, this is where... It's a means of consolidation, you might call it. A means of consolidation of Germany under Prussia, absolutely. And this is where we get to, you know, how the Austrians dealt with this defeat. Well, one of the interesting things that, of course, starts off this period is that immediately after Königgratz, um, Franz Josef looks around for a new um, Austrian foreign minister, and he chooses the unlikely figure of a Protestant Saxon called von Beust. Um, von Beust himself is a very interesting character. He had been um, the foreign minister of the, the Kingdom of Saxony up until that point. He had been instrumental in stabilizing the situation in Hungary after the 1848 revolutions, and he had been continuously agitating in the intervening period for Saxon independence and the independence of all of the small German kingdoms yes, at the he was expense. A, he was a strong anti-Prussian, right? Uh, not just an anti-Prussian, he didn't want Austrian domination either, or he would prefer Austrian domination over Prussian domination simply because Austrian domination was considered to be far looser in terms of its overall consolidation of Germany compared to a Prussian domination or a um, or a greater Germany, so to speak. So he, in his own right, is an interesting character, but you mentioned the fact that he was anti-Prussian. Yes, this is a, um, a key component of this. Of course, Saxony had fought a war alongside um, Austria in the German Brothers War, albeit it didn't um, you know, contribute significantly to that war because the war was over so quickly and the main decisive battle, of course, was Königgratz. So um, after the defeat of Königgratz, von Beust has made the foreign minister and his foreign policy strategy is trying to prevent the unification of Germany. This is um, Austria's last hurrah to basically prevent the inevitable. You know, whilst on the one hand, you would say that Austria, you know, had it already accepted in theory, its loss of any influence over the German states. Um, its foreign minister was trying to organize some form of coalition to um, stop Prussia. However, because of the military defeat at Königgratz, you have the issue of what do we do with our um, rebellious, rambunctious um, minorities, especially the Hungarians, whose constitution has been suspended since um, the original revolution in 1849. And this is where we get to um, the Hungarian situation. Um, 
there are two principal um, figures from the Hungarian side. One is Julia Andrashi, and one is um, uh, Ferenc Dias, who I've got a, a little image on the on on, on the right hand side here. Andrashi is the prime minister. Yes, uh, the significant thing about um, both of these men, Dias and Andrashi, is that they have both been part of uh, Lajos Kossuth's uh, move towards an independent Hungary in 1848 and 1849. Um, Dias had essentially, you know become part of the new parliamentary faction after the um, February patent had created a Hungarian diet again in 1861, albeit a much more reduced Hungarian diet. It only ruled over a part of what was considered historical Hungary with concessions given over to the Croatians and the um, Romanians in particular. And they didn't, um, they didn't have the same kind of independence in terms of powers as well. It was no, absolutely. This, this was a much more diminished diet in comparison to what you've seen before 1848 or after what, the what, what kind of powers were, were cut away um? Yes, well, when we're talking about the, the diets or the crown lands, we're talking about a system which was applied to all of the Austrian crown lands, essentially, in this sense that Hungary was given no more privileged position than any other part of the monarchy. You still had a, um, a Stadthalter who was appointed by the Austrian government, and the diet essentially was there to manage, you know, selectively some, some affairs, but again, this was always ambiguous in terms of what affairs were left to the diet. So, you, so when you, say, um, you say that it was governed by... Um they had these 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 new local rulers brought in were these sorts of um you know viennese bureaucrats the sort of german town men um as opposed well, to yes, the hungarian gentry well yes this is where it gets quite difficult you have a um a reichsrat a german a, basically a uniform austrian parliament and you have the local diets which are you know comparatively disempowered to what we see later after 1867 with the austrian parliament the hungarians try and boycott it at first simply because again um they they believe they're contributing to a system which is uh, trying to facilitate the centralization of the kingdom and erode their ancient privileges by assenting to this idea that, you know, Hungary is simply a constituent province or a member of all of these states with no particular privileges over, say, or any of the crown lands in um, Western Germany. And this is where we get to the, um, the situation involving the compromise. Of course, as I mentioned, the Hungarians had already been boycotting this. Um, and Rashi, it's an interesting figure in the sense that he'd been actively involved in the revolutionary government of um, 1848-1849, and then he had gone into exile. He'd gone into exile first in London, you know, following um, Lajos Khrushchev, and then he went into exile in France during the um, the, the Second Empire period, and um, he was actually hanged in effigy in um 1851 for his part in the um, the original revolutions. Nevertheless, um, he came back, was allowed to come back into the country in 1858. And by um, 1865, as part of this diminished diet, he had been elected alongside with Diak as part of this um, new liberal bloc who had... And, and his, um, would it be fair to say that his pro-independence views had cooled somewhat? Absolutely. The significant thing about the Diak faction, this is the so-called compromise faction, is that the Austrians... Um, you know, Diak and Andrashi had um, called on their pro-independence, their anti-Habsburg policy, and they were willing to make some sort of agreement with the Hungarians, so long as they were, you know, given, in effect, you know, complete autonomy over their own domestic affairs. And this is where we get to the compromise. On the one hand, von Boyst, the foreign minister, is wanting to essentially, you know, galvanize the um, the peoples of the monarchy towards a you know a potential um war with a war of prussia to regain its former territories and there is also a um hungarian minority the elect basically the elected majority party of the diet from 1865 who are willing to do a deal under Ferenc Diak. And this deal is the so-called Ausgleich or the Compromise of 1867, whereby Hungary is restored to its, you know, m many of the um, laws which had been established in April, the yeah, so-called April laws of um, the 1848 revolution were restored by which, you know, Hungary had, you know, complete, you know, pivotally among these reforms was the um the fact there would be no oversight no parliamentary oversight over austria the only authority to, sorry over hungary the only authority to which hungary was accountable was its king and the king would now be i mean his voice of on voice talked about the king of hungary and also the king in hungary so yeah, essentially so this he was um, this is dualism made explicit and sort of concrete 
Well, again, again, this is where it gets even more complicated. <laughs> you, you say um, du dualism is explicit. Um, dualism was explicit in the minds of the Hungarian um, party. The Hungarians, especially Diak, simply believed this was a restitution of Hungary's ancient rights and interpreting the relationship with Austria as that of a personal union. There happens to be a king of Hungary and there happens to be an Austrian emperor. But, the Aust but as Austrian emperor, um, Franz Josef has no power over Hungary, only as king of Hungary does he have any power. And um, but on the Austrian side, um, the von Beust faction, there is this argument that um, this conception of the Oberstadt, the idea that Austria is still a united um, territorial sovereign unit and Hungary is simply an autonomous part of it, not a separate part, which mm -hmm. happens personal union with it and it's made um it's made even more confusing by the fact that as far as i know um the hungarians um men like Deak and then um von boyce and many of the germans they they were often sort of meeting effectively as one cabinet and there were many sorts of conferences and they worked together or am i or am i mistaken in this belief well th th this is where i'm going to get on to the um, imperial and royal constitution in a minute but just um uh, summarizing this briefly um the point is that um andrashi and diak are part of this um hungarian liberal elite this compromise faction who are essentially uh, you know un undermining a lot of the pro um because you have to remember lazos koshov who's now in exile is still one of the most um you know f f fabled and famous of the hungarian patriots of 1848 and 1849 his um legacy looms large and of course he's still alive he's um who goes to britain then goes to america to agitate for the cause of an independent hungary and he calls men like diak and andrashi out for this compromise whereby he essentially says you know these are traitors that you know they're selling the country out the country is going to be drenched in blood essentially you near know, the blood of our fallen and um from the compromise point of view, however, you know, essentially Hungary has gained full autonomy. It has gained control over a much larger um, segment of, you know, the former monarchy. Um, areas such as Transylvania, which um, during the preceding period have been given virtual autonomy, are going to be, you know, subject to part of the so-called lands of St. Stephen, a greater Hungary in which only around 55% of the population are actually ethnically Hungarian. And areas like Croatia are going to, you know, be restored to that subordinate position under Hungary at the same time. But, so but at the same time as making these gains and in the independence, they also sort of preserve the security of being part of the empire, you know, um, um, economically as well as militarily, or at least I would assume that would be a draw. Well, when you talk about the military aspect of this, there are two territorial armies that are created as a result of this. There's the Austrian Landwehr in the west, and there is the Hungarian Honved in the east. But in terms of an actual army, and in terms of military affairs, there is only one army. There is the uh, the Kaiserliche und Königliche Army, the um, the Imperial and Royal Army, under the direct command of the Emperor, um, with no oversight from the you know the individual sort of um, parliamentarian factions essentially, and um, this is. You know, going to be a key cornerstone of um, the endurance of um, Habsburg dynastic power, rather than Hungary, you know, becoming this, this virtually independent power throughout this time. But in terms of like joint affairs, joint ministries, there is of course the creation of a joint finance ministry, which refers both to the Austrian part of the empire and the Hungarian part. There is a joint foreign ministry, which is the continuation of the um, the, the the influence of the uh, Ballhausplatz, the um, the office of uh, Metternich's state chancellor. However, there is no um, overarching prime, and of course there is a war minister, but there is no overarching prime minister of the empire. There is the emperor. The emperor appoints prime ministers to the Austrian half and then the Hungarian half. This idea again of parliamentary accountability isn't something we go we're going to see in Austria at this time. Austria is still ruled dynastically by an executive monarch, monarch and remains a monarchy throughout this entire time. It, it, even calling it a constitutional monarchy is a bit of a nonsense because it is a monarchy with constitutional elements, but the monarch is still the um, the glue which holds this entire system together. Even when you're you know referring to you know him talking with his ministers, he will deal with his ministers ind independently rather than as this part of this cabinet structure even though there are joint ministries and um we'll get into that a bit later but of course one of the issues for this um already is that um many slavs in the empire are unsatisfied by this agreement um the you know of course in the east in hungary you have the slovaks um and you have the croatians and in the um austrian half of the empire you have the slovenians you have the czechs 
and you have the um, Polish, and of course you have the Ruthenians. Um, the Czechs in particular are unsatisfied with this agreement. And so from 1867 until 1871, you have this agitation by the Czechs to try and allow for some form of um, bohemian equivalent in the Ausgleich, some bohemian equivalent to the compromise, whereby Franz Josef, as, he, as you can see in this image in uh, Hungary, will go to Prague. He will be crowned as King of Prague and he will swear by the ancient prerogatives of this ancient kingdom and essentially afford you know, the, um, the diet in Prague, the diet of Bohemia, which now be expanded like Hungary to include Moravia and Silesia, um, the same sort of rights which have been afforded to the Hungarians. And this is the so-called um, fundamental law of 1871 and this is where you know the, the nature of the monarchy sort of fundamentally gets subverted because as i mentioned you know von boist was um you know a saxon being imported here and he simply believed that this was you know a temporary measure to win the hungarians on side and then to win back you know support for ultimately you know the austrians humiliating the prussians and um so re restoring their position a way to restore your position in germany without having the hungarians and the slavs breathing down your neck for the, for, again, it's best to see it as sort of a temporary measure from the Austrian side. You know, on, on the one hand, you know, von Boyce was, you know, genuinely sort of celebrated in the in the Hungarian half. And the fact, again, he wasn't an Austrian, the fact he was a, um, a German foreigner brought into the situation. You can see a bit of the um, the restoration of the alliance between the German revolutionaries and the Hungarian revolutionaries in 1848. But um, in terms of this like brief stint of um, Austrian revanchism, um, it really doesn't last very long because when, when you look at the um the foreign policy of von Boist is a complete failure. You know, his principal foreign policy objective is to form an alliance with the Russians and form an alliance with France to again again engage in a future war with um with Prussia. And of course this fails. And you know from a Hungarian point of view, the ironic thing is in empowering the Hungarians, the Hungarians now have an effective veto over his foreign policy. The Hungarians under Tisa, as you mentioned, the new prime minister, have no interest, sorry, under um, Andrashi, the new prime minister, have no interest in allowing for Austria to reconsolidate itself in Germany, expanding, say for example, taking Silesia away from Prussia, one of the ancient provinces, and therefore going back and then humiliating <laughs> the Hungarians abandoning this um, temporary agreement. The Hungarians want this arrangement to last, you know, in perpetuity, essentially. So um, the foreign policy of von Boist fails. He isn't even able to back up, um, you know, um, the expansionist aims of um, Napoleon III vis vis areas like Luxembourg. When the French are invaded, the French are alone against uh, alone against um, now a united Germany. The Russians do not intervene to stop yeah, this happening have, either. Um... Do you have the empire yet, or is that slightly later? Yes, and at the beginning of um, 1871, you have the creation of the German Empire during the yeah. Franco-Prussian War, and this, of course, you know, leads to a quite dramatic change from the the foreign policy of Austria. Now, any attempt of Austria, you know, wresting control of Germany back from Prussia is basically impossible. Prussia has proven their domination not only over. Um, German affairs, but over European affairs through military force by defeating all of its principal opponents and keeping the one, you know, major land power who could have potentially prevented German unification, um, Russia, from interfering. So essentially, by 1871, von Boist has been prevented with a fait accompli, and now you have this issue of um, bohemian agita agitation. And the fact, again, in order for um, the situation to take place, um, Franz Josef is appointing various, very, you know, short, short stints for um, minister presidents in Austria to resolve the situation around um, Czech antipathy. And he finally um, appoints a foreign minister, uh, von Hohenwart, to organize the so-called fundamental laws of the Bohemian crown. Now, for the Germans in the Austrian, in the Austrian Empire, this is a disaster because it would have meant giving a Czech um, minority control over a significant number of um, Austrian Germans. We're talking, you know, roughly 40% Germans in the lands of Bohemia and you know, Bohemia, Moravia and Silesia. And so you have um, in their minds a very proud history of being, you know, the top dogs, essentially. Yes, yeah, since the um, since the Battle of um, White Mountain, effectively, and the dispossession of many of the rights of the old um, Bohemian estates. And um, this would have meant a complete reversal of that. And so there is essentially a conspiracy run by von Boyce, the foreign minister, and by the Germans themselves under Wilhelm, because now the Germans have a vested interest. Essentially, 
had this been ha allowed to go ahead, had this, um, you know, this tripartite compromise whereby the Bohemians had been elevated within the monarchy like the Hungarians, um, it would have given the local Germans within the empire enough impetus to actually defect from Austria and join up with the newly created German Empire because they would seem to be a, legit, a legitimately aggrieved party. They were not wanted within the monarchy. Their rights were being course, dispossessed there's everywhere. A, there's a strong strain of sort of pan-Germanism in the sort of propaganda and the political program of the German Empire. And and within the um, the German liberals themselves under uh, under von Beust. So yeah, um, this... So this um, falls apart and the fundamental laws are scrapped because of, um, again, the foreign intervention, the fact that the Germans would have potentially um, turned against the empire and it would have given too much power to the Czechs. So, and also, you know, this, if anything, it cements the control of the Hungarian faction at the same time, because the Hungarians have no interest in allowing the Austrian half to give their own Slavs power, because then, of course, the Hungarians are thinking, well, then we'll have to give the Slovaks and the Transylvanians and the Croatians more autonomy, essentially. So yeah. the Hungarians and the German liberals are very satisfied with the, uh, the elimination of any, you know, potential um, granting of autonomy to yes, Bohemia you have a, and Moravia and Silesia. Because you have a strong alliance between the sort of German middle class that have um, um, sort of, you know, taken a huge part in the bureaucracy, the town people and the Hungarians. And there's this conception that the Hungarians and the Germans are the two, I believe the term is literally used, the peoples of the state. And there's this idea that, um, that, that, that there's there's a strong strain of bigotry as well that you know the the Slavs who are you know um, considered backwards, considered mostly agricultural, um, can't take part in the government. They don't want them to. They want to keep a monopoly of the Hungarians and the Germans. Yes, yeah, so I'm less sort of interested in because of course the Habsburg dynasty was willing to go ahead with this plan. It was only when faced with the intractable opposition of these elements, you know, of these um, German liberal elements, does it eventually withdraw, and again, the possibility of a intervention from Germany. So yeah, the, the monarchy is sort of even above, you have these German bureaucrats and these town people and you have the Hungarians, but the monarchy, the Habsburgs, conceive of themselves as independent as an explicitly this is a dynastic rule. They have that that idea. And so they don't they don't want to um identify themselves with any specific group they want to they want to be above them all and so they're more amenable yes you, you can say i mean uh agb teller refers to this as a proprietary relationship whereby the the austrian rulers you know rule above the people not of the people not from the people essentially it is a dynastic conception of rule which isn't founded in any ethnos in particular but a grander conception of the dynastic um composite monarchy essentially so um so it's worth taking into account as well that um just on the question of Bohemian Moravia, is that you say that there's a significant German minority anywhere from 30 to 40 percent, and that's true. Um, the the sticking point is that they're not geographically separate from the Czechs either. Um, say as you know, if we go further forward in history ever so slightly, and we look at um, the you know the Sudeten question of uh, of the 30s, um, then there is a, a geographical separation between the Germans and the Czechs and Slovaks. Yeah, the Germans are all um, on the sort of outskirts of the West, you know, the sort of Western ring. And the, nor and uh, the Northern but, perimeter, yeah. yeah um, but here it's, but, <laughs> it would be extremely impractical. Well, that's the thing. And uh, yeah, and because of the, these population groups being so intertwined and there being no geographical separation in, in, at the provincial level, there's really no way to, um, uh, as you say, uh, apostolic, to basically put this plan forward. Because if they could have actually geographically separated them, um, kind of like the post 1918 plan of you know the austrian germans um maybe something was more feasible but that hadn't been done at this point and so you had these germans who would have become essentially sort of ironically dis dis disenfranchised minorities in a sort of sub crown of the austrian Habsburg monarchy in a sense yes and um of course there are attempts within the monarchy's lifespan to try and resolve the situation by partitioning the lands of bohemian moravia but that's um a little later on so just to quickly summarize mm -hmm. on the um by 1871, essentially from 1867 to 1871, one can legitimate, legitimately say, at least from the um, Austrian side, the German side, that this um, idea of the Oberstadt, the you know, was was prevalent. The idea that the Hungarian compromise was just going to be a temporary arrangement. However, by 1871, the Austrians have now been locked out over their former position, as you know, already they've been locked out of their position as hegemons of Italy after the loss of Lombardy, Venetia, and their influence over again the their alliance with the um, the papal states and of course the indirect rule over Tuscany and parts of central Italy. Now they have been locked out of Germany at the same time. Um, former allies such as um, Bavaria 
had now um, allies such as Bavaria have been um, locked into this new German state and of course have gone along with it essentially and so Saxony there's, so there's not too has joined this Austrian state. So, so, um, so there's not this idea that you can sort of fight a war and then you know no. peel off a little state here and there no, and sort of no, up no, against no, a unified no. empire. So no, the, game, the game has changed fundamentally from this point and this is reflected beautifully by the dismissal of um, von Beust in 1871 and replaced by Julia Andrashi who was then prime minister of um, the Hungarian half of the empire. Andrashi comes in and reorientates Austrian foreign policy definitively away from Germany away from Italy and towards the Balkans. And again, dealing with the situation of the ever ever declining Ottoman Empire, essentially. So you can say that from this period of 1867 to 1871, after Austria had been successfully defeated by the Piedmontese, the French and the Austrians, now Austria had fundamentally had to re redefine itself as a great power, but in terms of its own domestic relationships with its own peoples. And, now, they, also, these... um, and they also had no real choice because, I mean, you mentioned the situation is really unstable in the Balkans. You also have other groups, you know, notably the Russians, trying to make moves in the same area. And so the Austrians have to sort of head them off at the pass in that respect. Sorry, can you repeat that? I, I was just saying that um, in the Balkans, you also have um, um, Russians looking to take advantage of the situation as well and certain other states. And so the Austrians kind of have to make a move in that. Direction. Yes, exactly. And of course, this is going to, you know, fundamentally, you know, change the nature of, you know, Austrian Russian relations moving forward. So um, here we have the, the post um, Auschwitz situation, a situation um, I broadly lumped this into the imperial and rural constitution. And this is going to be, you know, roughly looking into the nationality question and, um, you can say the nature of the of, of the political situation within the Austrian and Hungarian parts during this um, during this period. So, um, as I mentioned, we have the compromise. Uh, the compromise, you know, applies to two areas. In the east, you have the crowns of Saint Stephen, the Hungarian territories, and another uh, name for this territory is Transnistria. In the west you have Cisnitania, which is, are the lands represented in the imperial crown of the, the imperial reichsrat essentially so all the non-hungarian territories and they have no sort of um historical consistency because you have areas such as dalmatia you have areas such as galicia lodomeria you have areas such as the old archduchy of austria and of course the old crown lands of bohemia all lumped together in the areas which aren't <laughs> part of this um uh, greater hungary so it's an arbitrary designation to say the least it is yes it is quite an arbitrary designation all the all the territories and of course there is no um there is no linguistic or you know, cultural unity to these territories even the name um Cisletania just means the lands on this side of the lighter which is a tiny little river separating um modern day sort of um Preschberg and the old boundaries of the kingdom of hungary from austria essentially so um that there isn't even like an effective name of course austria is a um, you know, in terms of the nomenclature, Austria is just a colloquialism for referring to this period. And you even the idea of a Austria-Hungarian monarchy, which is the official name of the um, the state during this time, is a bit of a misnomer because the Austrian part is in no way, as we conceive of it, just relegated to the Austrian, you know, the old Archduchy of Austria or a German nationality. I mean, this uh, as we'll go on, this idea that the um, the Germans were, you know, liberally oppressing everyone and their half of the empire is <laughs> a very overly simplified view uh, as we get into this. So. Um, I was just going to say, and also we have to take into account also because um, it's kind of apparent by this map as well. Um, but and other ethnographic maps represent this as well. Is that also all the Austrian Germans themselves weren't necessarily confined to what you refer to as the sort of the old uh, Ostmark, the old Austrian sort of uh, duchy. Um, Hungarians themselves weren't necessarily confined to the the centre, you know, Pannonian plain of of the old Hungarian kingdom. Um, by this. By this stage of the life of the empire, you had a lot of um, sort of internal migration and pockets of populations, you know, scattered everywhere. You know, the famously in the, the uh, Szeleki Germans and the and the Galician Germans and the you know the Hungarians that settled in Croatia and what have you. And this would lead to uh, dramatic implications later. But um, like you yeah. say, it, it does it does enter dynamic, which is often overlooked when people try to simplify the uh, the Austria-Hungary question. And it's even more true when you talk about the big urban centers, because of course, you know, people are flooding into the cities with what with industrialization and and um yeah, you have you have huge diversity in the cities, especially especially Budapest, you know, which of course, um, this kind of diversity, um, especially the the um preponderance of certain groups has very ugly consequences fifty years down the line. <laughs> 
Yes, I think if it's possible, um, I would like to sort of stymie the allusions to the post-war situation simply because we're going to have a lot, a lot of time, you know, further down the series to talk about that in depth. Um, but you know, looking at this map, a lot of people are sort of pointing out, you know, how how confused this map is. Well, this is a map which is referring to a very specific um, period of time. Um, I've mentioned on this map the the era of um, Kalamantiza and the era of the Iron Ring. Now, getting before this point in 1871, like I mentioned. We have the dismissal of Bon Boist, and Andrashi becomes the um, the joint foreign minister over the entire Austro-Hungarian Empire. Well, domestically in the Austrian side, you have um, Prince Ausburg. Asapok uh, taking control over, you know, the internal affairs of Austria, and this is where we we call the um, the local German liberal um, period essentially in the east. Um, Diak Fenech Diak dies, having basically been the um, the elder statesman, if not the um, direct ruler of the Hungarian half of the empire, and his um, you know. The, the, effectively successor is Karloman Tisa, who establishes the Hungarian Liberal Party, which will be the dominant force in Hungarian politics for the next um, 30 years or so. So during the um 1871 until 1879, uh, you have Germans dominant in the Austrian part of the empire, and you have Hungarians dominant over the eastern part of the empire. However, uh, someone mentions in the chat, you know, what was the sort of franchise? Well, of course, the Austrians had um, already established a courier form of voting system, whereby the various estates, you know, the city, the urban dwellers, the aristocracy, has an assigned number of seats based on indirect elections. Well, right from the beginning in the Austrian half of the empire, from 1873 um, onwards, there is constitutional tinkering. And this is going to be a constant theme you see in the Austrian part of the empire. So in 1873, the indirect elections to the Reichsrat, the Chamber of Deputies, are abolished. However, in Hungary, um, the franchise remains incredibly limited. Essentially, a elite of um, you know Hungarian magnates um, who all vote for the Liberal Party are entrenched in this position of power. And when you have the arrival of um, I mean, they've been they've been sort of preserved by the unusual situation. You have a much larger sort of um middle gentry in Hungary than in the rest of the empire, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, a, a vast gentry, and this makes up the um, the official ruling class of the of, of the Hungarian part, all of which are sort of relatively pro compromise and um, are willing to sort of go along and support the Habsburg monarchy and quiet the sort of extremist um, pro Lajos Kossuth elements. And um, it's during this time, so from 1875 to 1890 in Hungary, during the ascendancy of Karl Mantiza, that we have the consolidation of a separate Hungarian, you know. The government essentially you know many of the um before then much of the hungarian administration had effectively carried on from the you know the remnants of the austrian administration but under the machinery of the liberal party which continually you know wins elections during this period you have the creation of a separate hungarian bureaucracy essentially and the consolidation under a strong um minister president um carla mantiza which is you know going to continue until um 1906 and then of course estevan tiza his son is going to take over in the hunger in the austrian however it's more complicated in 1879 the German liberals are essentially removed from power due to this constant issue regarding the Czechs boycotting the political system which had been set up. Essentially, since the you know the fundamental laws in 1871 were dashed, the Czechs had been um, boycotting the the system of power for you know eight years up until this point. And I've got this some um, image of this figure on the right, uh, Kant von Taffer. Von Taffer had briefly um, been elevated to minister president um, during this you know initial period of confusion from. 1867 to 1871, but from 1879, von Taffer is made the minister president again, and he serves as minister president for the next 14 years until um, 1893, and he organizes a new political coalition to govern the Austrian half of the empire called the Iron Ring, which is going to rehabilitate the Czechs and bring them into government. It's going to rehabilitate many of the nationalities. So, for example, the Galicians are given, you know, um, vast amounts of autonomy, and so they willingly partake in, um, you know, the pro Habsburg lobby and then you have the rural sort of pro-catholic elements in the countryside who join up with this um teaser-esque government at the same time however as you can see on this map who then decides to turn against the um the monarchy it is the germans so in the north here you can see the red areas at the tip of um, bohemia this of course roughly corresponds as you were saying marcus to the old to the um new sudetenland regions that we see after the um the collapse of um, austria hungary and of course the eastern germans so when we have the more centralized areas in the north particularly around vienna um vienna goes into the opposition faction as well 
because we have these um, pro-German anti-Slav elements who are basic and also liberal and socialist elements who are agitating against this basically takeover of power in the East by um, the loyal minorities, you know, to the emperor essentially. So whilst the um, Czechs don't have, you know, their separate political constitution as they would wish and they continually agitate for, they are brought back into this um, position of power at the expense of the Germans. And it's during this time that you have the rise of the German Social Democratic Party, the Austrian Social Democratic Party, but you also have the rise of the Christian Social Democratic Party made of the, I'm sorry, Christian, Christian Socials, who are made up of the, you know, petty bourgeois who are generally sort of pro-monarchy, um, but also pro-German. And then you have the more extremist elements of the you know the Linz program such as um Schönerer, who are advocating for the complete separation of the Austrian Germans from Austria joining with um the the German empire and converting to Protestantism. so all of these um radical German elements are being born out of this this period of the so-called iron ring and you can see this um beautifully illustrated with the the electoral map here yes and the Christian socialists are explicitly Catholic right yes yeah. Um, so, so in terms of like um, summarizing this, in um, 1906, because of again the, the the confusion of the system, there's always tampering with the election system. So, T so Taffa is finally removed from power over a failed attempt to expand um, expand the franchise. Um, Badene, one of his successors, comes in and tries to organize for Czech language rights, whereby the um, the administration in Bohemia Moravia must be effectively bilingual. They must it's speak been um, German before that, right? It had been German before that, and many of the um, Czech um, uh, aristocracy and the Czech elites, Czech bureaucrats, had grown up with the expectation that they would speak German. Now, with the um, the language patent essentially making it necessary for there to be a bilingual aspect to um to you know to to to, to work and operate as part of this bureaucracy in Bohemia Moravia, caused a such a significant backlash from the German um, population that um he was fired by Franz Josef, mm -hmm. and the the language patent essentially was you know qu quickly dissolved you know after Badeni's dismissal but yeah, nevertheless represents, I suppose a sort of you know I, I can understand how the Germans would perceive that as sort of an assault on their influence and prestige because German was supposedly you know the language of state the language of high culture and the language of the army as well which is yeah. you know a, a crucial aspect we'll get to and um of course you know in 1906 in an attempt again to um, gain more sort of working class support from the monarchy and undermine these um, liberal bourgeois elements, you know, as, because basically, you know, this, this entire thing is trying to find a constitutional workaround to get um, a loyal cabinet to essentially, you know, we make too much of trouble. In 1906, um, the Austrian half gives um, universal suffrage um, throughout, you know, the Austrian half of the empire, and this caused, you know, complete bedlam <laughs> within the parliament. And um, the <laughs> imagine my shock. <laughs> the the rise of um you know the Christian socials and the um the social the, the social democrats of which you know become one of the largest parties not just um in Austria but also in, in you know, the largest socialist party in Europe at this time yeah. so um all of politics, these um politics is thrown open to the masses so all of these um, radical elements are happening whilst in Hungary um as I mentioned we have the rise of Kalamantiza but we also have the lingering element of um Kosovism this um, desire for Hungary to be independent of the compromise and, you know, throw, throw it off. And th this is an interesting question to get into. What is the role of the monarchy in all this? In 1906, the Liberal Party, which had been basically ruling Hungary, you know, undaunted for the last 30 years, loses an election to the, um, the so-called Party of Independence and the year 48. And this has been run by Ferenc Koshov, the son of Lajos Koshov. And rather than um, accept a pro-Hungarian um, independence prime minister, Franz Josef simply decides to ignore him. The party is, un is unable to form a government without imperial consent. It collapses and a new party under Estevan Tisa, the so-called government of um, public work, um, the party of public work is established and eventually Estevan Tisa will take over and consolidate a new pro-compromise faction within Hungary. And how is this possible essentially? Well, Looking at the you know various electoral reforms, looking at the various parliaments, especially within the English context, one tends to look at it and say you know you know obviously you know traditionally, especially in England, the parliament uh, creates the government. You know the prime minister is responsible to the parliament. This didn't exist within um, the Austro-Hungarian situation. Um, the Austro, the Habsburg monarch, in this case Franz Josef who was, of course, um, Emperor of Austria 
and King of Hungary um, appointed all of his chief ministers and appointed the prime ministers from both halves of the empire and would routinely dismiss them whenever they were unable to essentially, you know, um, dispel, you know, the, the constant agitation, re revolutionary and sort of ethnic agitation that was going on throughout this period. So in the case of um, the Hungarian situation, because you ultimately need the support of the emperor in order to govern, and because, of course, the emperor was never going to countenance a independence orientated government, um, they simply weren't able to function because, of course, the emperor is also the supreme commander of the armed forces at this time and there is one single army under imperial control which the hungarians the independence minded of hungarians believed essentially was a force of occupation stymieing any independence movement so the last word throughout this period was the emperor because crucially he had um this this dynastic connection to many of the peoples in the empire this wonderful quote of franz Josef, um saying you know my my job is to save my people from their governments essentially um <laughs> But it's this crucial element that the the common army, the um, the imperial and royal army, is loyal to the um, the Austrian emperor, the Austria what, what emperor and the Hungarian sort of, king. Um, because I understand that the army, you know, they, they have this they have this idea of being loyal to the emperor. But um, what was the sort of ethnic makeup of the army? Was it mostly Germans? Uh, no, it wasn't mostly Germans. There was a significant Hungarian contingent. In fact, when we get to the First World War, uh, the Hungarians are actually the single uh, biggest ethnicity providing troops to the army. And again, the fact that they are pro-Hungarian, sorry, pro-Habsburg throughout this period should tell you quite a lot about the, um, the loyalties of the army. And that, of course, radically shifts towards the end of the war. But nevertheless, during this time, the army is still firmly in the, um, the pro-Habsburg camp. Royalist camp, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so yes, I mean, obviously, one of the elements here is that um, the Hungarians are able, the compromise faction, the liberal faction, is able to maintain, you know, almost total control with that exception by controlling the franchise. And when, you know, in, in the absence of that, even when you have, you know, um, the, the faction of 48 arising to challenge that, there is significant gerrymandering to try and, you know, ensure the, the liberal party is always, you know, in a state of authority, essentially, and um, so essentially, also... extend extending the franchise to those who you know will support you. Yes, and the franchise extension is very little. We're talking between five and eight percent from 1870 until 1913, essentially, as opposed to the franchise in Austria, which is universal. Mm. And and again, this speaks to the fundamental sort of power dynamics in the West. There is no obvious constituency upon which the emperor can rely to govern Austria on his behalf. So he has to rely on a series of aristocrats forming these um, temporary coalitions, of which one of the most successful coalitions, is, of course, is the Iron Ring formed by von Taffer. But of course, that collapses in 1793 and you could say definitively collapses with the attempts of Badini to introduce bi bi bilingualism. However, in Hungary, there is a constituency. There is this Magyar pro-compromise liberal elite who are holding on to power and able disproportionately to exercise significant influence within the the running of the empire so to speak i mean isn't and, there um there, there's something like five hundred thousand of these of these um sort of middling nobles in hungary they, they are really are a large group so, so so when you say um the franchise was sort of restricted i assume you know it's restricting it's restricting poorer hungarians um, um other groups how did they do that? Was it through property qualifications? You know, you know, tax yes, payments? yes, yes, essentially property qualifications, but also language qualifications. One of the conditions upon which, you know, the, the, the compromise was ushered was the creation of the so-called Basic State Act within the Austrian half. This gave um, Austrians the right to, you know, use that they're basically their customary. The, the legal definition was the customary languages of public life. In reality, within the Austrian half, this really just meant um, Croatian and Italian, the languages which are already, you know, publicly accepted. Italy being uh, Italian being a a, Kultursprache, a, um, mm. a cultural language, and Croatian it's considered a sort of higher language. Yes, and Croatian, of course, being a um, a loyal constituent member of the empire, you know, Czech. This idea of Czech being recognised as this um, customary language within the empire, there was an ongoing battle, as we've elucidated. In the Hungarian half, however, um, during the revolutions of eight, um, of eighteen forty eight and eighteen forty nine, there had been an attempt to so called magyarize the country, whereby you know you have the the integration of the entire lands of Saint Stephen under a um, centralized rule from Buda and Pest and a, after 1877, Budapest. And this policy slowly begins to 
come back to the fore under Kalaman Tisa, yeah. by which the so-called provisions guaranteeing the rights of minorities to speak, you know, to speak their own language within the empire are eroded. So by the point of where we have the, the, the arrival of Estevan Tisa in the um the early 20th century, um, Magyar, you know, Hungarian is the sole language of administration and schooling, essentially. Minority schools are being and repressed is, and shut down. Is this in sort of Romania and, uh, and, and, and Slovakia? Like yeah. Yes, in Slovakia and the Carpathian, Ruthenia, and of course the Banat, which has a significant Serb population at the same time. So um, within Hungary, we see a consistent push to magyarize the country to make it into a um if not an ethno state then a state which is culturally and linguistically hungarian essentially you know, so long as you speak hungarian so long as you acknowledge yourself as hungarian even if you may be ethnically german you may be ethnically um, romanian you could be ethnically serbian slovakian etc or the special relationship before to the creation mm. you can basically assimilate into this idea of hung um of, you know hungarianness well, and well, we um, talked about that last time with german where it was a similar situation saying centuries previously where German was sort of, you know, even if you weren't an ethnic German, you, you could use German to get ahead. And so this is sort of an attempt to establish um, Hungarian on the same plane. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, this is an attempt to sort of um, establish Hungarian, the Hungarian language on the same plane as the German, you know, um, yes. a century or so earlier. Yes, the one exception, of course, being the the language in the army and the the language issue with the army is going to be a, cons a consistent theme. You know, German is that there is this push by the uh, the chief of staff and the German high command and the, the war ministry to ensure that uh, German remains the principal language with the army. Of course, the Hungarians are never satisfied with that, and they're constantly agitating for equal rights of language within the army. But domestically, within education, within law, um, Hungarian is pushed everywhere. And in response to increasing agitation, you know, now it's unlike in um, Austria where you have the, the, the socialists are essentially accepted into accepted as part of a um what the parliamentary makeup of the Austrian half like we see in Bismarck's Germany in the Hungarian half there is rampant persecution against socialists and anyone who would upset this order of the um the, the compromise faction and this is you know consolidated with the protection act of 1912 and the uh, even the idea of like opposition like a loyal opposition as we would re recognize this in the english constitution is stamped down essentially trying to create this idea of a um a, a de facto one-party state in hungary under the, the the remnants of the liberal party and the um the public um the public works party and with um teaser um, he, this goes so far that there's even an attempt to assassinate him in the um, Hungarian parliament building by another parliamentary faction. And of course, this just gives the Hungarians more impetus to crack down harder on all of these opposition elements. So in, in summary, whilst we're having a constantly evolving and you can almost say um, a slow collapse of political authority in the Austrian half, within the Hungarian half, you have this consolidation under a very small elite of um, you know hun hundreds of thousands or so Hungarian magnates. And I suppose this situation was sort of, um, the creation of this situation was aided by, again, the sort of, um, um, you know, the, the Western half, the, the Austrian half is more industrialized. And so they have this... Um, um, with that in mind, you can understand how these moves towards suffrage and what have you were made in the West, whereas in the relatively speaking more underdeveloped East, um, you had these more um, um, back, backwards ways of doing things, if I could put it that way. And this is that's a wonderful segue to talk about the economic situation within the empire, which is pretty crucial. Now, I've named um, this period the Grundesite, which might be con quite controversial to some people who are familiar with that term. Uh, the etymology of Grundesite literally means sort of the era, the time of the businessman or the time of the entrepreneur. In Germany, this tends to refer to the period from roughly about 1850 until 1873, when you have the great um, stock crash and you have the great which follows. However, within the Austrian context, Grundesite can refer either politically to the period between 1867 and 1879, when you have the German domination of, um, you know, the affairs of Cisleitania, but you also have this um, growing cultural movement at the same time, which is you know, reflected in the, the architecture of this period, this massive expansion of um, bourgeois, in particular bourgeois housing, bourgeois boulevards, you know, similar to sort of the Haussmann effect we see in France during this time. You know, within the early 19th century, you had um, the uh, 
uh, Biedermeier style. And of course, this moves into the um, the Grundzeit style where we see, you know, architectural, you know, German revival, historicism, neo-Gothic, all of these elements are, you know, expanding throughout the empire. However, this is um, crucially going to talk about the, the economic focus because um, our artistic focus is more going to be dedicated to our next stream which is going to be talking about the, the city of Vienna, where we can really go into um, the cultural aspects of the empire as embodied in um, the imperial city of Vienna. Yeah, it, really, it really does deserve its own, its own treatment. Yes. Now, um, during this period, so from 1870 until 1830, the 1830, sorry, 1913, the population of the monarchy increased by 50%, so from roughly 36 million to 49 million just before the beginning of the war, making the monarchy the the third largest population within Europe, just behind Germany and um, Russia. And of course, this made it more populous than France at the same time. Um, you know, there'd already been, you, you talk about this sort of general disparity economically. Well, of course, there had been elements of proto-industrialization in Vienna, in Bohemia, where, of course, in Bohemia, there was a large iron and coal industry. Um, during the 1830s and 40s, the um, Austrians began to import a lot of um, machine tools and early manufacturing equipment by the 1840s and 1841. You have the creation of the first Austrian railway, which connected uh, the city of Brunn in Moravia to um, to Vienna, and you would later have a um, steam train also connecting um, uh, a Buda to Pest, etc. All of these also, um, things. Um, you also have the creation of a central bank, do you not? Yes, you had a creation of a central, an Austrian central bank, goes all the way back to, I think, 1816. But in 1879, you have the creation of a new Austro Hungarian bank. And of course, this um, compounds with the fact that you've had the um, the, the the breakaway of the customs union sorry the breakaway of the independent um, customs units between hungary and austria i think in 1851 and uh, one of the fundamental aspects of the compromise is how to deal with finances essentially because we have different bureaucracies collecting um uh, you know, different fight uh, different taxes different tariffs but we have a um a united finance ministry so every 10 years the um hungarian part hungarian delegation austrian delegation meets to um hammer out hammer out is actually um you know how much money is going to be allocated to each half of the empire and how do we renegotiate the um the customs union essentially because it's important to note that in terms of like understanding this is a real dual monarchy a personal union um croatia hungary and austria even had their own passports there wasn't um mm. a united austro-hungarian or monarchy passport during this time so even moving around the empire um you had different passports albeit you know s such sort of um measures to <laughs> to ensure sort of security on this weren't nearly as stringent as they are today um one crucial aspect of this is that austria's economy was actually growing uh, very fast during this period. It was actually growing faster than Britain, France, and Germany. Germany had had most of its sort of great economic expansion mm -hmm. uh, in the 1860s and 70s. And after 1870, um, the Austrian economy grew roughly about 2% every year, which doesn't sound very much, but put this in perspective that the the economic hegemon of the world, essentially Britain, was only growing at 1% post the Great Depression. Yeah, yeah no, you, you have a lot of industry taking off. And of course, um, you have a lot of people being made rich very quickly, a lot of sort of nouveau riche. Um, um, and then and this has loads of cultural impact, especially when we get to Vienna, which is more more my forte, if I'm being honest. But um, you also have um, um, uh, troubles brewing, right? I mean, you know, you have the, the crash of 1873, which at the time in America was actually called the Great Depression. Um, it was that bad. Uh, and, and many of these sorts of um, trends, you know, you had all sorts of situations where you would have um, um, railway magnates and they would get, um, they yes, would get loans and, and there was yes, speculation. That's, that's a crucial point. Um, from 1841 until 1873, um, the development of Austria-Hungary's railways had essentially been private as it had been in Britain during this point. Yeah. But after 1873, we have the creation of an imperial and royal railway ministry. We have the nationalization of much of Austria-Hungarian rail. And the effect of that is that from 1873 onwards until 1913, as you can see with these maps I put up here, um, Austria-Hungary massively increases an integrated now a rail network, not just in Hungary, but in all aspects of the empire, integrating this economy over, we're gonna see the complete disaster when we talk about the dissolution. Um, and one of the effects of this, you know, we talk about, you said the relative backwardness 
of um, Austria-Hungary, especially in the economic sphere. Well, Austria-Hungary actually had more in the way of railways than France did at this time, or Britain yeah, did at this right. time, and far more than Russia did at this time. It was only lagging behind Germany in terms of the sheer sort of scale of its um of its of, of, of its system of railways. I would and also of course, note, by the way, um, um, as part of this. Um, you know, you have state control and then the state handing out contracts and, you know, it always leads to, you know, corruption and high prices. Um, um, the, the, you had a very, very similar situation at the exact same time in the United States of America where, um, you know, you had had a, um, in the northwest of the, the United States, the burgeoning, you know, in the west, you had had a, a massive private railway built. It was quite successful, whereas then you have the, the, the U.S. Civil War. Um, after the Civil War, you have the massive consolidation of federal power, of central power, and then you see the huge expansion of, of the railways, the Northwestern Railway, many of which are sponsored. These are government contracts. And um, again, you see massive corruption and economic trouble down the line, debt and what have you. And um, it seems to be a very similar situation here. Well, there's a caveat to that. Um you know, Radley will never for forgive me if I don't mention this, but um, <laughs> a, a fundamental element of the, especially the Hungarian party and parts of the Austrian um, finance ministry was this commitment to um, aspects of classical liberalism. So between 1895 and 1904, uh, Eugen von Bomberwerk is the um, imperial finance minister. And it's during this time that there is this obsession of, you know, having a balanced budget, the state not falling into debt, the strict adherence to the gold standard, you know, cutting inflation etc ending the state subsidies as opposed to increasing them such as you know the the ancient state subsidy on sugar all of these elements were rolled back you know during the um the, the 10 year sort of intermittent ministry of um Bomberwerk. and of course one of the platforms of the the teaser faction with you know sporadic investment in industry is of course a commitment to classical liberalism at the same time so after the stabilization of hungary during the period of um Karloman teaser um, towards the end of that period, so between 1880s, 1890s, we begin to see um, industrialization in the Pannonian plain, in the Hungarian plain. And as a result, Hungary becomes, you know, e economically, the center of Hungary becomes, you know, relatively economically developed, essentially. And it begins to become one of the largest exporters, privately, of food throughout Europe. And this is going to have um, fundamental effects. But I mean, there's even, you know, ma massive mach machine industry. There is a um, significant Austrian um, automobile industry. And of course, there is the the famous uh, Ganswerks in, um, in Budapest, who are responsible for the um, the creation of all these these wonderful, essentially tram lines, which connect all these newly mm. expanding cities, essentially. And of course, uh, before the um, the twentieth century, uh, Budapest and Vienna will be outfitted with their own. Um, underground rail networks at the same time. So this period is um, a huge, a huge um, p p boon in um, infrastructure development, the expansion of ports, notably the city of Trieste, and um, the infrastructure built on the um, the expansion of the railways and the state run railway system. Yeah. And many and many people are, um, many peasants are lifted out of poverty, get new jobs in the city. Um, there's a huge expansion of the proletariat, which of course has has important political consequences as well. Yes, and uh, the fundamental thing you mentioned is you know, this obviously alluding to immigration. There's a fundamental like, shift in immigration during this time. You know, there is a Galicia Lodomeria is the poorest part. Yes, it's very underdeveloped, the... and many people, including including large numbers of Galician Jews, move to places like Budapest. Yes, precisely, and um, they also moved into in, into Vienna, essentially, and. Um, also, we see this, um, you can say, especially during the Istvan Tisa regime, this alliance between um, the Jewish faction, again, the economic contingency for the Hungarians and the Jews. And in the West, we're going to talk more when we get to Karl Luega, is um, this this growing sort of political anti-Semitism originating with Schönerer and tempered under um, figures like Karl Luega, who we were talking about before we came on, had this yeah, wonderful I mean, saying. There's, that, even, there's this perception, because I mean, I mean, in Budapest, it must be said, I mean, something like, a, you know, at, it, at its height, something like a quarter of the population is Jewish. And there's this idea amongst um, many of the more boorish you know, nationalist Germans that the, the the Hungarians are are controlled are controlled by the Jews, and this animosity builds up partially out of this sort of Hungarian German rivalry. But it, I mean, it doesn't help that in Budapest, uh, in, in in Hungary, uh, more generally, many of the businesses, you know, a hugely disproportionate number of um, of businesses are are owned by Jewish people, which of course leads to um, resentment itself and and all, all sorts of 
very dark consequences. Yes, uh, but uh, sorry, Mark, it's just one point. Um, of course, it's not um, all sort of doom and gloom for Galicia and Lodomeria because surprisingly of all the regions in Europe, Galicia and Lodomeria is one of the first regions where we have the, um, the first sort of major uh, European scale exploration for oil. And um, of course, during this time, the you know the area around Lemberg is famous for you know oil exploration. But of course, the the other the other major areas, of course, Baku in the Russian Empire and modern day Azerbaijan. So um, oil is discovered within the boundaries of the empire. Uh, yeah, what I was going to mention, you sort of touched on it, both of you, a little bit. But with the uh, with the ray, the uh, how about the establishment of this vast rail network and the rapid industrialization. You know, um, a lot of people sometimes might reach the conclusion that it was something confined solely to Austria, but in fact, it was uh, not the case. In fact, this deindustrialization was surprisingly decentralized. And um, for instance, Czech, uh, what would become Czechoslovakia, certainly the Czech part of it um, became highly industrialized. In fact, didn't they call it at one stage like the, the factory of the empire or the workshop of Austria-Hungary or, or what, whatnot? There's a, there's a term like that. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got easy access to coal, so it was the natural place to sort of establish establish a business, you know? Exactly. So, yeah, so, you know, infamously, the, the Skoda works would be founded in, uh, in Prague, um, which became the fundamental producer for, um, uh, for arms for the Austrian army come the First World War. Um, but but uh, other, other places, well, I mean, we mentioned Budapest and, uh, you know, the oil exploration in, uh, in Galicia. Uh, this... Uh, this uh, this advancement occurred very quickly and over a, a large part of the empire. And, and you mentioned to Trieste, um, apostolic, you know, the, the Austrian littoral, uh, broadly speaking, became highly developed, which is sort of the, the Italians, for instance, use the, um, the risonamento as, as a, as a casus belli or, or rather as a, as a claim to the Istria. But, um, it was also because it was actually one of the more highly developed regions of the empire as well. Um, you know, yeah. between the ports and the, and the urban, uh, infrastructure of the, uh, littoral, it was very, um, a very highly coveted prize that the Italians sort of ended up getting a hold of following World War I, yeah, as an example. Yeah. And in terms of oil as well, I mean, we must remember, of course, in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, you're having um, um, huge gains made in terms of naval technology as well. You know, you're having ironclad ships for the first time in the 1860s, I think, in the American Civil War. Um, um, and oil is, of course, um, um, you, you, you do get the transfer to oil ships, I think, at the end of the 1800s. And so um, oil yeah. becomes massive, massively important to the British, yes. to the Russians. Absolutely. Have a but no, and to the Austrians, well. and to the Austrians, because, of course, the Austrians are expanding oh, yes, their navy at leaps and bounds. Have, I mean, they actually they actually named the ship the Franz Josef, didn't they, the Austrians? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it's quite a massive one. Because I was going to say, because uh, I think it was Iron Duke who mentioned that we, ha we have to cover the, uh, Lissa at some point. So let's not forget that before the streams end. <laughs> Right. There's one last very important point which one has to cover regarding the economy, which is the rather economic dependency on Germany. So roughly 50% of all of Austria-Hungary's exports and 40% of all imports um, went to Germany. Essentially, uh, Germany was instrumental in terms of the you know the the advancement of you know the Austrian manufacturing industry. And so right from the beginning, we have this um, economic dependency on Germany, you know, significantly compared to other nations in Europe. Such is, you know France and Britain which you know, together don't represent you know more than half of the economic sort of um, relationship that Austria has with Germany and the economic relationship with you know Russia is virtually non-existent compared to that of Germany so in terms of looking at um the economic pressure that Germany can you know exert on Austria that's going to be uh, that's something to hold in the uh, the back of your mind as we get on to the um the foreign policy question but just before we get on to that we'll talk about the um the dynastic situation if that's all right um we left um, our conversation last time talking about um, the marriage of Franz Josef I to um, uh, Empress Elizabeth, also known as Sisi. Um, well, of course, their relationship had, you know, almost completely broken down by the by the 1880s, and um, Franz Josef had begun a uh, relationship with um, uh, a performer known as uh, Katharina Schlatt. Um, however. Do also have the issue with um, Crown Prince Rudolf, the the heir apparent to the throne during this time. Uh, Crown Prince Rudolf was a notorious liberal and um, also a Hungarian sympathizer, very much carrying on in the political mold of his mother, who of course had um, uh, patronized the cause well, of um, yeah. 
the Hungarian compromise. And um, to make matters worse, he had been forced into an arranged marriage with um, Stephanie of Belgium due to the fact that there were very few Catholic um, Catholics of rural standing left in Europe, essentially. And um, this marriage was incredibly unhappy. The crown prince would have continuous affairs. He would contract uh, gonorrhea and syphilis, and he would actually pass this on to his wife, making her essentially infertile. And then we have how the- very How very liberal of him. <laughs> and of course, I mean, it's not, I mean, now he can't produce an heir as well. He feels that he's failed in that respect too. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So um, he, he can't produce an heir. And this is where we have the the infamous um, Etheric Myling. Um, in the, I mean, all sort of elements of this. I mean, I, I had um, Charles Coulomb on to um, discuss this and um, uh, to talk. I mean, he basically refers to this as the um, the the Austrian version of the Kennedy assassination. Now, in terms of like a broad sort of understanding of what actually happened, th th there is an understanding. I mean. One of the most important effects of this, of course, is that it was, there was a completely botched cover-up of what was, I think we can fa we can fairly say, as a um, uh, a murder-suicide pact between um, uh, Crown Prince Rudolf and his um, then mistress um, uh, Mary von Vetsera. Um, the assumption was, from my point of view, that he knew he was dying of syphilis, and he, I think. Uh, again compounded with the fact that he was the product of a um an incestuous relationship between first cousins and that that and the fact that his mother i think it's fair to say had some issues with her mental health doesn't create a um a very beneficial situation for the son but that and the, the fact that she was also suffering from um you know the terminal condition back in those days which was syphilis the um the austrians would later sort of review this and say that um his mind was disturbed when he supposedly, you know, um, shot um, Mary well, Bonnet Sarah actually, and then um, shot himself. Well, yeah, because Franz, Franz Josef was desperate to get his son buried in the imperial crypt. Crypt, and, and, and of, of course, course he had to get a special papal dispensation I mean, for that. Yeah, I mean, if you were a, if you were a suicide, then of course, you know, you couldn't. Yes, exactly. And, um, you know, right from the beginning, we have sort of conspiracies abounding. You know, one conspiracy was that Mary Vetsera had um, murdered the crown prince through poisoning. And that, of course, the Vetseras had been you know, a recent addition to Viennese court culture. And the idea was that the Vetseras were using crown prince Rudolf to um, rise for the ranks. And of course, this caused a, um, a major fall in the um, the aspirations of the Vetsera family. Um, but at the same time, there is also this, this other theory that um, uh, Mary von Vetsera was actually pregnant with Rudolf's child and that she'd actually died during an abortion and after the tumor, you know, after the the trauma caused by the botched abortion loss of his um uh, mistress, he then committed suicide after the fact. Yeah. So all of these and elements much of are this um, is, much of this is based on the fact that I believe in the report that was given um when, when the bodies were discovered, um um rigor mortis had set in in Vetsera, but not in Rudolf. And so there was this idea that he had died a couple of hours later. Yes, well, th th there wasn't a post-mortem performed on Vetsera. Vetsera was um, quickly scurried away and um, buried privately. And it was only after the, the Soviets ransacked that area in the 1940s, and later they exhumed the body in the 1950s, had they really begun to examine her body. Well, of course, um, with, with Rudolf, there was a post-mortem found. And again, the, the idea that the original cover-up was that he died of an aneurysm of the heart. But of course, this um, scandal eventually spread through wildfire, wildfire throughout Europe. and um, Seriously, I think damaged um, Fran Franz Josef's. Um, uh, you you can you can the say prestige, it, um, the prestige of the, the, the presti yes the prestige of the the Habsburg monarchy that and the fact that um, his wife um, uh, um, Empress Elizabeth was murdered by an Italian anarchist in Geneva no, about, called uh, Luigi Lu Luigi um, in eighteen ninety eight. All of these elements. I mean, this leads to a. Um, a t terrible quote from him by which you know i'm spared nothing on the surf because this isn't just the the sole existence for the tragedy which he's going to encounter in his life because already he had his um liberal brother maximilian had been offered the throne of um mexico and he'd been shot um during the um the resurgence of benito yorawe so he'd his brother had been executed his son had um killed himself in a murder suicide pact and his wife had been murdered so um, franz Josef sadly has a very um tragic life but um you know one incredibly enduring as you know the, the greatest of the austrian public servants and of course um the, the most important effect of this is that the uh, the 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 crown or or the aspiration to the crown then falls on the head of um, franz ferdinand yes well uh, not not immediately and th this gets into um <laughs> 
the so-called Belvedere Circle. Um, Franz Ferdinand is the nephew of um, Franz Joseph, because of course Franz Joseph only had the one son of Rudolf. And um, Franz Ferdinand was the son of, uh, Franz, of uh, Friedrich Karl, who um, died in 1896. So, um, what did what did he die of? Was it was it tuberculosis or? I can't quite remember. But um, the point is that um, uh, Franz Ferdinand didn't become the uh, the Thronfolger, the heir to the throne, until um, seven until eighteen ninety six, and you know, he's a, he's a, he's a very interesting character, Franz Ferdinand, and um, historical assessments of him are sort of range sort of wildly from one extreme to the other. Um, in terms of my assessment of him, he um, he takes this this idea of him as the um, the heir apparent to the throne, you know, exceptionally seriously. Um, and he begins, you know, right from the beginning to, he sets up his own court. Essentially, um, Franz Josef makes the interesting decision to afford the throne Volker his own court at the Belvedere Palace, the Belvedere Palace being the former residence of the um, the Austrian military hero Eugene von Savoy. And the Belvedere Circle beca becomes this center essentially for um, reform-minded intellectuals to come to Franz Ferdinand and petition for ideas of how to reform the monarchy after Franz Josef essentially died. And I've include, um, included two images here. One is the um, uh, uh, Popovici plan for the greater states of, um, of United Austria or Greater Austria. And one, of course, is one of the trialist proposals, this one by um, uh, uh, Ivo Pilha, which was a, um, a Croatian nationalist, about creating an aggrandized Croatia, incorporating elements such as um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Dalmatia, and parts of the littoral to um, a part of a greater Croatia, essentially. But that's not one of the only trialist solutions. Others included the um, annexation of the Slovenian territories, or the Vindishmak, to um, the the South Slav state as well. And some trialist solutions even award Galicia Lodomeria to Hungary, interestingly enough. And this is based off a very old um, historical illusion when the original partitions of Poland happened in um, 1772. Um, Mary Theresa had claimed the territory based on the very ancient precedent set by a Hungarian king known as Louis the Great, essentially. So all of these ideas were flying around as to how to reform the monarchy, whether we restore it along historical lines, i.e. with this trials conception, by creating the grandized kingdom of Hungary, or do we abandon this idea of these historic um, communities and we reform it along ethnic lines, as you can see in this um, United States of Greater Austria, in which you have you know, basically ethno states carved out of the empire and you also have a series of um, German free imperial cities as well based on that um, German influence we were alluding to in our last stream. So, so, so are all of these um, these proposals? This is all happening with the sort of approval of Franz Josef. It doesn't seem to me like he no, would, no, would be no, happy of this. No, like I said, this is this is one of the you know titles epaulets given to um, Franz Ferdinand is that he was basically the the leader of his his, his Majesty's most loyal opposition. Essentially, this was um, you know an intellectual breeding ground for potential reformist ideas, which Franz Josef had no interest in tinkering with, so long so as he lived, essentially. Of, it's a sort of 19th century think tank, we might put it that way. Yes, precisely. And um, many sort of um, figures who would later sort of rise to the highest echelons in um, uh, the Austrian government, such as uh, Ottokar uh, Schernin, such as uh, Lamarche, who would become the, the last of the um, Austrian minister presidents are all part of the circle. But um, in terms of like why, you know, this was tolerated by Franz Josef, there was one um, very specific reason why this was tolerated by Franz Josef, which was the Austrian conception of monarchy, like the Prussian conception of monarchy, is that the Habsburg ruler has to be in charge of the army. He has to be directly the supreme commander of the armed forces. And by 1906 in particular, the ability for Franz Josef to actually carry that out energetically was seriously compromised by the fact he was now 76. And so the emperor began bestowing more and more responsibilities upon Franz Ferdinand, establishing his own military chancellery, upon which you know um, Franz Ferdinand would appoint many ministers, such as um, uh, Bloch Arenau, to go and basically be the liaison between all of the military departments, the Hornweg, the Landwehr, the common army, to ensure that the um, 
the heir to the throne was always kept, you know, um, kept abreast of all military developments essentially within the empire. The idea that um, the emperor could die at any time or in the event of war, Franz Ferdinand would be the supreme commander of the army and not the emperor, meant that the emperor performed, the, the heir to the throne had to perform a crucial military role within the conception of this um, ancient Austrian monarchy in which the monarch is an executive ruler and he leads his people within times of war essentially. And so the Franz Josef was very happy for Franz Ferdinand to be bestowed this power so long as he fulfilled this very specific function. However, as was the case with Franz Ferdinand, he wanted to massively expand that function. And this didn't help with the fact that um, he'd also married morganatically in 1900 to one um, Sophie Chotek, which caused does, a huge... Does that mean, that means he didn't marry a noble or, or he didn't marry a, a royal? A he didn't royal marry person. someone of the blood royal. He married a... Um, the Choteks were a were a prestigious um, bohemian family, but they weren't of royal blood like Stephanie of Belgium was. Mm. And so from Franz Josef's mind, Franz Josef, in, you have to remember that Franz Josef has dealt essentially with successive defeat after defeat. You know, he's lost Solferino, he's lost Königgratz. And in terms of his own conception of his role, his conception is to preserve the integrity and the prestige of the House of Habsburg into perpetuity, essentially. And yeah. so... Um, he, Mar um, marrying into local gentry doesn't exactly yes, yes, fill exactly. them with joy. Yes, I mean, look look at how, you know, in our own history, when um, Edward, the Fourth, Edward the Fourth married um, Elizabeth Woodville, <laughs> how many dispersions that caused yeah. on the House of York. This is a very similar situation. And well, so the Berlin. <laughs> Yes, well, to a lesser extent, but yes. Um, so with um, Franz Ferdinand, um, this marriage is seen as a direct affront to the emperor. And um, in so much so that in 1900, he proposes this, um, this oath essentially on Franz Ferdinand, by which he has to forswear that his children have any right to the throne. Either any child he has from this morganatic relationship are going to be... Um, checked off the line of succession. And so it'll then turn to um, our Archduke Charles, a, another grand nephew of Franz Josef to inherit the throne after Franz Ferdinand dies. Charles, which is, Charles does eventually inherit the throne. Though, yes, right? he does in 1916. Yeah. So um, this is a significant factor. And of course, this means essentially that um, this relationship, this um, creation of the military chancellery is founded on this idea that the emperor must fulfill this militaristic role but franz joseph personally can't stand it can't stand franz ferdinand he makes no effort to become a friend with his nephew and again this is compounded by the fact that he is married morganatically and this is something the emperor will consistently refer back to as the lady in waiting or the serving serving <laughs> serving girl essentially who um, <laughs> has pretensions of being an austrian empress i love it i love it oh my gosh uh, just out of curiosity, um, I am just because I I don't know the answer to this, and I figured you probably would. That um, with that uh, with Franz uh, Franz Ferdinand's morganatic marriage, it was that because uh, you mentioned that uh, with Rudolf there was just a shortage of uh, esteemed Catholic princesses essentially on the continent. Um, do you think that was in any part to do with Franz Ferdinand's marriage as well, or was that just a uh, was that not at all a consideration? No, do you think? That, that wasn't. So in, I mean, he married Sophie Chotek for love. And one of his overarching concerns thereafter was that Sophie Choktek be recognized by you know other monarchs or by various sort of um civil functions. Because in terms of like this relationship, you have <laughs> to understand a sort of, as a sort of salve to his own his own conscience, perhaps. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because I mean he did marry for love. He did want to elevate her essentially. And during his reign, sorry, during his time as the Thronfolger, um, as married to Sophie Chotek, Sophie Chotek couldn't accompany him during any of the official functions he was involved in as the as the um as the heir apparent essentially she was yeah. essentially ostracized from the austrian court and wasn't allowed to publicly associate with franz ferdinand of course one of the tragedies is that when he was visiting sarajevo in a unofficial function he used this as an opportunity to bring his wife along and that just so happened oh. to be the time where gabriella oh, oh. wanted to assassinate him cruel Oof. irony yes so yes another cruel irony but so in terms of, you know, establishing his position, of course, when we get to our next slide, which is talking about the road to war, um, you know, Franz just, Ferdinand, sorry, yes. I was just going to say briefly, uh, just because we're sort of, you still like the picture of Franz Ferdinand there. Um, what was the relationship between, say, Franz Ferdinand and uh, the Kaiser in Germany? Because um, obviously he, he, he was, the was, uh, Franz Ferdinand was obviously uh, over time gradually sort of accepting incrementally it was more and more cool, workload from... Yeah, from uh, uh, Franz Josef, who was just you know quite elderly, 
yeah, I just wanted wanted to ask if you could sort of yes, wax were, on that for a bit. Th they were friends. It's fair yeah. to say they were friends. They were they were both avid hunters, and they both had very similar conceptions of monarchy. And um, Wilhelm II had been one of the few monarchs to actually recognize Sophie Chotek and endorse the marriage from his point of view. So right from that incident, and again, that was a, you could you could say a formative incident in creating this friendship, Wilhelm II's recognition of Sophie Chotek. In fact, um, one of the last sort of meetings before the war, um, uh, you know, with Wilhelm II, with another prominent um, a figure, is with Wilhelm II meeting um, Franz Ferdinand in the same month of June, just before he's assassinated, essentially. So no, they were um, they were fast friends, and um, some superficial remarks could be made that the reason why um, the Germans were so willing to um, offer a blank check to the Austrians was due to the personal proclivities of the Kaiser having lost essentially his um, his erstwhile well, ally. In Franz Ferdinand, on a and on a personal and political level, because he, he certainly he took the assassination be, quite personally. Uh, sorry, yes, exactly. I was just going to say he he took the assassination quite personally, and and that friendship would uh, reflect that absolutely. Yes, he was quite a rash rash man, from what I know about Kaiser Wilhelm. He was re ready to rush into these sorts of things for good or ill. Well, Bismarck did call him headstrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So here we get to the the foreign policy angle of the um, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, the the so-called road to war, and um, we we started this off by saying that um, you know von Beust had been removed and replaced by Andrassy, and that Andrassy had fundamentally um, redesignated you know the the sphere of Austrian influence away from Germany, away from Italy, into the Balkans, and and of mm. course you know this also improved. Impro means an improved relationship with Germany and um, a sporadic relationship with Russia, so to speak. So from 1703 until, um, sorry, 18, um, 1873 until 1878, um, we have the first incarnation of the Drei Kaiserbund and, you know, the alliance between um, the Tsar of Russia, then Alexander II, Wilhelm I and, um, and Franz Josef, albeit it's again a, a loose private understanding between the monarchs essentially not to go to war with one another and to exert sort of greater reactionary influence throughout Europe, basically a restoration of the Holy League as conceived by Metternich, albeit with um, a much weaker footing due to the so-called um, great betrayal by Franz Josef in, during the Crimean War in which the Austrians hadn't supported the Russians. Um, mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, the, the issue of the alliance between Russia and Austria is further complicated by the fact that now Russia and Austria are competing over the, the, the declining influence of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, essentially. And um, this is the, the coup de grace of, um, of Julia Andrassy, which is the occupation of Bosnia-Herzegovina during the, um, the Eastern crisis. Essentially, the, the Russians have gone to war with um, Turkey in um, 1877, and they had occupied a large part of Bulgaria. The Russians had then imposed a peace treaty, a unilateral peace treaty on um, Turkey, by which the uh, a greater, a greater Bulgaria under basically Russian influence was established, and they would crucially have access to the, um, the, the uh, Adriatic Sea in the so-called Treaty of San Stefano. Of course, this creates a major European um, diplomatic crisis. The British are interested in containing Russian expansion and having this massive expansion of yes, Russian influence. The, the Brits know. want the Mediterranean as well, right? Uh, yeah, virtual unimpeded control over the Mediterranean. And of course, they're expanding their influence in Crete. They're expanding their influence in Cyprus. Of course, they already have Malta. They yeah. have now, you know, expanded into the Suez Canal, etc. Of course, they have um, Gibraltar. Um, all of these elements. And of course, Austria has a vested interest in this as well. They have no interest in um, Russia becoming the dominant power in the Balkans either. So um, as a result of this, the the Congress of Berlin, which ensues from 1878 onwards, we have the severe limiting of the territorial expansion of Bulgaria, but we also have the military expansion of Austria. Um, the Bosnian uh, Vilayet, uh, a former you know Ottoman province, was occupied by Austria during this time. But crucially, as a result of this treaty, Austria was able to occupy a series of forts, therefore disconnecting Serbia from Montenegro, thereby you know denying Serbia access to the um, access to the sea in a form of an alliance with Montenegro. But it also gave the Austrians, you know, carte blanche to 
invade the western half of the Ottoman European possessions. So attacking Salonika, attacking Greece, attacking Albania, essentially. So um, Andrashi, you know, believed this to be a great sort of coup in terms of expanding Austrian influence, you know, deeper into the Balkans. However, domestically, this was, you know, bitterly resented because the Hungarians, <laughs> ironically, despite him being a Hungarian himself and him being, you can say this, the end of this weird career where he'd started off as a um, independent Hungarian freedom fighter and he ended this career expanding the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the interest. <laughs> <show. laughs> yeah, it's quite quite bizarre, isn't it? Wait, was there also some sort of idea of, you know, the Habsburgs taking the fight to the Turk and, and, and what have you? I can imagine I can imagine some sort of jingoistic notions. Well of course he'd also been um the the personal envoy of the revolutionary government to the Turks, imploring the Turks to intervene on the Hungarian side during the revolution again. So another um <laughs> the slimy man. So so another little um, irony. I, mean, here. I was gonna say what is history if not ironic? You know, there's an, <laughs> there's yet another example of it. But um I, I have read I have read um that apparently the um the Austro-Hungarians could be quite ruthless in getting the sort of the Serbs to play along. You know, they would sort of play and um, use the Muslim population against the Christian population and, and use them to suppress them and and all of this. It, it's quite quite unedifying. Yes, and um, that that is quite true. The relationship between Serbia and Austria during this time it is, from Serbia's point of view, is far more servile, and um, you know th this will allow us to you know engage in this sort of more seriously but just just to finish off this actually ends uh julia andrashi's career because he's essentially alienated the hungarians by expanding the monarchy and therefore potentially adding more slavs to the empire in the form of you know the Croats and the serbians the sort of balance, and uh, yeah. yes and disrupting the balance of power at the expense of the hungarians essentially so he is you know removed from power due to agitation from his own side and one of his last acts is to cement this growing alliance between the germans and the austrians by signing the jewel alliance which will you know be in 1879 which will be incredibly important for the development of the war which you know a couple of decades later will compound with the italian alliance with um with germany to form the triple alliance mm. but um from this point on you you mentioned you know the serbian situation with um with Austria. Well, th this is again fundamentally important to note. Serbia had been essentially a vassal of Austria um, up until this point. You know, Serbia had, um, during its original revolution, had only acquired the very northern tip around Belgrade, which was just, you know, opposite the military frontier of the Austria Hung of the Austrian Empire, and therefore basically making it <laughs> essentially completely dependent on Austrian support to guarantee its independence. They had to sort of do do homage to the, the yes. Austro-Hungarians. Especially as they were um expanding, you know, south into you know rapidly during during the course of the Balkan Wars. And um in nineteen oh two you have a diplomatic revolution in Serbia, in which the Black Hand group, a terrorist group, a pan-Slavist group, assassinates the royal house of um, Serbia and bring in a, another royal house, which had temporarily ruled for a couple of decades in the preceding century. Wait, 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 all of them? Yes, there's a bloody pogrom during in, in the palace where I, I believe it's the Abrenovic dynasty is essentially wiped out in the bloody oh, anti-Austrian pogrom and a new irredentist pro-Serbian Russophile family is brought in and um are made the kings of hungary as part of this um this terrorist action by the black and were hand they, and as um, were that were the russians sort of in support of this we, well yes the russians um from 1902 until 1908 essentially serbia switched its um its alliance away from austria towards russia and this is where we get to the um i've got the figure here the image here of um alois von erntal um, this is where we get to the, the so-called Bosnian crisis of um, 1908. The Bosnian crisis in which um, Erental was conscious that the occupation of, um, uh, of Bosnia-Herzegovina, according to the Congress of Berlin, was only allowed for um, 30 years. And so as 1908 approached, the Austrians wanted to simply annex the region rather than give it back to Turkey, or worse, allow a weakened Turkish administration to be overwhelmed by a aggressive Serbia and take that region and add, you know, a, a further sort of hostile neighbor at the expense of the Austrians. Essentially, you know, for, for national security reasons, the Austrians, and also for reasons of prestige, the Austrians have no interest in relinquishing their essential conduit towards expanding their influence in the South. 
And so, yeah, well, Aaron, yeah, I mean, you can't you can't continue to expand into the Balkans if you have an independent Serbia right behind you. It's just now annexing. Yes, yes, now now annexing potentially Bosnia Herzegovina. So from um, sorry. I was just going to say too, uh, just in the context of this relationship with the with the Balkans and the powder keg that it, the Balkans tends to be in this period of history, um, that the Russians also sort of saw themselves as the orthodox protectors of um of the Balkans, and of course with uh, with the integration of Bosnia into the Austrian Empire as well, you have this sort of a friction developing between the Habsburg monarchy and this Serbia that's now sort of beginning to assert itself because uh, it's not just Serbia doing this. Um, the Bulgarians are asserting their dominance against the Ottomans. Uh, Gr Greece is doing the same thing. Um, so you've got all these sort of moving components in the Balkans at the same time of which the Austrians, you know, and, and, the, and the Russians as well as sort of uh, overlord protectors of certain aspects of the Balkans are sort of, it's almost a proxy war sort of going on, you know, in the Balkans at the same time. Yes, and of course there is now an independent Montenegro at the same time, and there, of course there is an independent Romania. Um, Romania, of course, had a, um, a Hohenzollern monarch, uh, which had been installed um, in the preceding decades. However, and of course, as part of the Triple Alliance, there had been a secret pact whereby the, um, the Austrians were technically allied with the Romanians. Um, however, this was a contentious issue and of course the Romanians ultimately side with the Entente during the First World War in 1916. So like the Italian alliance this is of course is setting up an unreliable network of supposed allies and of course Bulgaria despite entering you know its political its political life as part of the Russian faction then defects to the central powers um, during the First World War. So all, all of this is um, fairly complicated, but you know, the crux of this issue, of course, is Serbia, as um, because you have to remember, this is the, the time of sort of Yugoslav nationalism. We've already talked about um, a trialist conception by which the Croatian lands within the empire were united. But of course, there are a significant number of Serbs within that conception, within Bosnia-Herzegovina. And of course, Yugoslav nationalists want an independent nation of all the Slavs in the South, essentially. And the natural leader of that would be a um, Serbia. Now, this is what um, we, we essentially call, you know, within the Austrian strategic equation, a Piedmont. When we look at um, the early sort of relationship between Piedmont and Austria, Austria had been the dominant power within Italy throughout the first half of the 19th century. And then you had a revolutionary um, agitator in the form of the state of Piedmont, um, allying itself with the revolutionary faction to evict the Austrians from its possessions in Italy, essentially. Now, when you're looking at strategic considerations, and of course, the same thing happened on a much grander scale in Germany, with Prussia becoming another Piedmont. Now, a lot of Austrian strategic thinking was, especially by uh, the ultimately the chief of staff of the um, chief of staff of the um, the common army, uh, Conrad von Hutzendorf, that Serbia was going to become a, another Piedmont, where essentially they would ally with the revolutionary irredentist faction, and if not, you know, and potentially ally with Russia, like France had with Piedmont, uh, and, and then they would take, rally the Slavs in the empire yes, yeah. again in a war in a war against the Austrians, and if not detach. Um, all of these Slavic, South Slavic populations from Austria, they might even dissolve the empire itself had the Russians simply decided, you know, we, we occupy all this vast territory, we'll simply abandon it. So there is an increasingly desperate situation which is um, emanating within the, the, the basically the, the Bullhausplatz, the, um, the conceptions of the, the, the Austrian sort of diplomatic core. And so from that point of view, it, the annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina rather than the withdrawal makes complete sense. And Erenthal, of course, is interested in maintaining good relations with Russia. He wants to distance Serbia from Russia as much as possible to avoid a potential backlash. And so through an agreement with the then Russian um, foreign minister Izvolsky, um, as a caveat for Russian recognition over the, um, the formal annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina to the empire, um, the Russians would have Austrian approval for opening basically the Straits of the Bosphorus to allow Russian ships into the Mediterranean. Now, the Russians under Izvolsky had already formed their Triple Entente with the Allied powers, you know, France and Britain in 1907. Yeah, I was going to say, how, how did Britain take that? <laughs> but that's the point. That's the point, though. Um, the conception from Izvolsky is, OK, Austria is our principal rival in the Balkans and they are prepared to allow this. We have formed an alliance with France and um, Britain, you know, we basically reverse the the great game. We've reversed the period of containment. So one of the concessions out of this is um, that we can get 
access to the Dardanelles. We can basically um, achieve what we always wanted in alliance as opposed to through war. And of course, they are sorely mistaken. The British and French, despite being nominal allies, do not support this. They betray um, the Russians. And in return, Izvolsky, you know, goes on this war rampage, essentially, where he completely changes his position, saying, no, we're going to back the irredentist Serb uh, claims to um, Bosnia-Herzegovina. And um, in, in that case, you know, essentially it's the um, <laughs> the Germans who end up blackmailing him over this, the fact that he was, you know, fully implicated in supporting Erenthal which you know finally forced him to to back down and eventually he resigns in disgrace but um that should illustrate to you i think the incompetence of the the russian foreign ministry that you could so um um <laughs> disastrously sort of um mistake the the the, the 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 expectations of your allies and allowing this to happen. It seems absurd. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not exactly an expert on the situation to say the least, but he, even I even I know that the British wouldn't have taken that. I mean, it's it's absurd. I would totally totally change the naval balance of power in in the world. I mean, you know, you give the Russians another route into the Atlantic as well. It's just. Yeah. It's quite it's quite interesting that um in the in the Russian context of all this that uh, despite the the friction developing in the Far East you know, the so-called Great Game um you know where they sort of said that cartographers and grenadiers were rubbing up against each other in the Far East between the British and the the Russians and this uh, you could say what two or three century long um, contestation for the East Mediterranean and sort of this this tug of war between Greece being a you know a the Helena files in England and the and the Orthodoxy Brotherhood with Russia sort of being a, a battleground, and that it, that sort of somehow in the context of the in, in this sort of time frame, you have the Russians and the British just somehow sort of coming together to sort of form this triple you know this this triple sort of entente with each other, sort of despite that, and also despite of course that the British and the French really spearheaded the um the Crimean War, you know, that's the context in which this alliance has happened. Exactly, and of course the the part of this alliance from the Russian point of view is that this is a complete repudiation of the post-Crimean War settlement. The Russians are wanting to, again, this is also after their disastrous defeat against the Japanese in the Russo-Japanese War just a couple of years before, they are wanting to look at the Black Sea and the Balkans as a new avenue for imperial prestige, having lost essentially all access to the, um, the Pacific Ocean and their Chinese possessions in Manchuria. And of course, this aspiration by Izvolsky is frustrated. And so the Russians enter a such more, basically all aspirations of detente between Russia and Austria are ended by this period. And we enter a very precarious situation where the Russians and the Austrians are now agitating for influence over the increasingly dilapidated state of the Ottoman Empire. Because in 1908, the Ottoman Empire had been able to do nothing about the fact that one of its territories has simply been annexed without any sort of legal repercussions or compensation. And from 1912 until 1913, the situation in the Balkans erupts with the Balkan League, the Serbians, Montenegro, Greece, Bulgaria, allying against the Ottoman Empire and very short succession, depriving the Ottomans of virtually all of their European possessions, including you know, pivotal cities such as Adirne and Salonika, and only then briefly recapturing the city of Adirne after the um after the Second Balkan War. It, and then indeed, of course yeah. And Adirne was basically the heart of Turkish control in the Balkans, was it not? Well, Salonika as the sort of the heart of Macedonia, but Adirne is just literally west of um, Constantinople. So losing Adirne is, you might say, the um, sort of the fulcrum or the, sort of the keystone. You know, once you once you conquer Adrianople, which is Adirne, same city, you can march straight to Constantinople. That's I mean, it's also a symbolic. It. It's a symbolic site as well. I mean, Adirne was one of the great capitals, wasn't it? It, yes, it was absolutely. the first. Oh, it was the sorry, first. No Europe, yes, it was the first yeah. European capital of the Ottoman yeah. state. Yep. So, so, so yes, thing, yeah. so, so, sorry. Um, so, so yes, and um, obviously, you know, the, the Austrian situation is now incredibly tenuous because you're having this febrile situation in the Balkans. Now, the Austrians have been expanding the Navy and Franz Josef is, you know, one of the key figures behind this naval expansion. Uh, Esteban Tiza is, you know, agitating among, you know, most of the, um, the officials, you know, for, for a large army, more investment for the Austrian army. Uh, von Herzendorf is continually advocating for a preventative war, not just against Serbia, but the Italians already believing correctly that the Italian alliance um, 
is essentially, you know, unworkable, and the Italians will betray us, which eventually they do. Um, and of course, within the uh, the Foreign Office, uh, von Ehrenthal dies in 1912, rather tragically, and he's replaced by the incompetent Berchtold. And Berchtold basically is a, is a weakling who is a, um, a fulcrum for the various, because again, you have to understand the Foreign Minister within Austria-Hungary is the most prestigious of all the ministerial positions. And of course, an inherited position, you know, a cultural position, you know, from from such things such as um, what a lovely war that that play in the nineteen sixties, which is you know, <laughs> gives rise to the Blackadder conception of World War One, um, gives the impression that Berchtold was a was a warmonger who duped his emperor into into going to war. Other conceptions have him as um, Herzendorf's Herzendorf's puppet, essentially, you know, in terms of his preventative war strategy. Well, he starts off his career as the creature of Franz Ferdinand, ironically enough, and of course Franz Ferdinand and would later adopt a pro-peace policy, ironically, like his um, his erstwhile sort of Hungarian combatant, Istvan Tisa. And um, from this period, he's actually advocating for caution in the Balkans during this time from 1912 to 1913. However, the Austrians do try and stymie Serbian expansion by um, essentially forcing an ultimatum by which the Serbians evacuate the new um, independent state of Albania in 1913. And that again, could have potentially caused another war, but the Austrians are able to avert a war and prevent the Serbians expanding. Because again, Serbia has now expanded into Macedonia. It now has linked up with Montenegro and it's now formed an alliance with Montenegro. So well, the, the Serbians, the Serbians have their own ideas. I mean, they used to rule an empire in the Balkans centuries, centuries <laughs> ago. You know, there's there there are romantic notions everywhere. Absolutely, and of course, um, sorry, Marcus. On a, uh, just on on this point, just that also to think that these Balkan and nations which sort of uh i hate to sort of sound graphic but are sort of feasting on this sort of decaying ottoman vulture in 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 the balkans you know um take a seat like salonica the bulgarians have designs on it the serbs have designs on it the greeks have designs on it um the same is true um for you know you mentioned uh, Postolik, uh the bulgarians getting that temporary access to the mediterranean uh, via i think it was uh, the city of kavala um Again, that sort of changes hands between the Greeks and the, and the Bulgarians. These these Balkan nations have very much overlapping claims over this um, this uh, this Turkish held territory in Europe. And of course, again, as I was referencing before about their big proxy wars being fought, essentially, um, it takes someone like um, you know Berchtold to to realise that this is a, a a massive powder keg and mishandled it could start something uh, it could start something terrible which is actually what more or less would happen with the advent of the first world war in fairness um, i don't I ask, just, yeah sure Clumber. I, I was just going to ask you um you guys because of course you have the you eventually have the russian alliance with with, with serbia which kicks off the war um how much of that is due to sort of um um not only these these stri strategic concerns and and um, more material concerns but this idea of um um, the Russians being the sort of protectors of orthodoxy. I think that's a latent idea, but I think in 1914 that that position has basically been put to bed, especially due to the fact that. Well, I'll go and get into that if that's all right. Just okay, just towards no the worries, end. No worries, yes, no that that very much that very much looms large, and again, this idea of mm. pan-Slavic um, fraternity also looms large over the the Russian conception that the, you can say the aggressive conception of Russian foreign policy in 1914, which gets us into this you know, awful predicament. But just yeah, um, I mean, of course, the, pa <laughs> the pan-Slavism usually goes hand in hand with anti-Germanism. So sort of sort of in a sense though just just to sort of offer some bearing here is that you have the the i mean i know austria and serbia are not necessarily comparable entities but you almost have this german carte blanche with austria hungary regarding the franz ferdinand sort of uh, conundrum but also at the same time the serbs sort of realize that they certainly have russia in their corner as well on the basis of that orthodox brotherhood orthodoxy protection sort of m mindset and it's these two sort of irresistible forces that sort of come together. Um, and I'm sure Apostolic will elaborate on this, but that's sort of one of the major friction points here that exists. Yes, but uh, it's important to note that the Austrians didn't view the Russian position that way. The Russian, they, they believed did, the Russian did. threat was less um, was less obvious, and that they wouldn't mm. get involved in the situation with Serbia, which is what what, what I'll try and elaborate with. Um, you you yeah. mentioned earlier of Berchtold's um, understanding, you know, exercising caution. Well, I would simply argue that that is an extension of Franz Ferdinand's influence, because Franz Ferdinand is thinking about the the long term um, 
the long-term effects of the monarchy. He believes the monarchy is in such a precarious position in 1912 and 1914 that any potential war could potentially draw in Russia. He's very anti-Russianist in terms of his outlook, albeit Franz Ferdinand is also, you know, considering a possible alliance with the Austrians and the British to complicate the view that he's simply a, um, a friend and an ally of the of, of the Kaiser Wilhelm II, though he is principally concerned with Russian influence. At the same time, he is agitating for his conceptions of the reformed monarchy, as I demonstrated with the um, uh, Popovici solution or the conception of the trialist um, monarchy. So any extension of the empire into the Slav lands could have, could have potentially jeopardized all of those you know, by fundamentally altering the the balance of power between the various ethnicities. I mean, one <laughs> of his get, um. Then you get new ethnicities agitating. <laughs> I mean, one yes, the in terms of continues. the in terms of the agitation, of course, his one of his uh, Oren Popovic um was a Romanian lawyer, which is important to understand that um Franz Ferdinand had a um a, a Romanian um, preference um in his conceptions of the Belvedere Circle simply because the Romanians were a um a group which could be used to undermine the Auskalaish undermined the Magyar domination in the lands of St. Stephen. And of course, from the Hungarian point of view, the Hungarians on the whole hated Franz Ferdinand because he believed his raison d'etre upon becoming emperor was to undo their situation, undo the Auskalaish, and to favor the other minorities within the Hungarian realm, such as the Slovakians and the Romanians, at the expense of the Hungarians. However, the issue with the Romanian situation is that he couldn't promise too much in the form of concessions to the Romanians without also giving the Romanians hopes of joining with an independent Romanian state, um, which had existed since the, the, you know, really since the 1860s, but you know, formally since the 1880s. So he was having to um, toe a line essentially between giving the, the, the Romanians you know, aspirations of autonomy within the empire without allowing that to feed into this idea of a greater Romania, which of course will or, or, or could be created out of the, the ashes of the empire in the First World War. So all of these um, elements in play and Franz Ferdinand is um, aware of all these elements. And this is one of the reasons why together with his erstwhile enemy is Devance, um Istvan um, Tisa, um, there is a great advocacy, advocacy for caution due to the precarious nature in the empire. It's also one of the reasons why when we actually have the outbreak of war, the actual possibility of um, a war with annexations, especially in, in the South, looks very unlikely. And the main sort of um, beneficiary of any sort of annexations would have been Bulgaria and not the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which would only have expanded in terms of its influence and economically. But getting to the, the situation uh, re-Serbia, um, Serbia had, you know, arrived as the complete victor of the first two Balkan Wars from 1912 until 1913. The second Balkan War was between the Balkan League and Bulgaria because Bulgaria believed it had been cheated out of the potential gains of that war. And so Bulgaria was humbled and naturally after that humbling, Bulgaria gravitated under its Tsar Ferdinand to the central powers, the pro-German and the pro-Austrian camp. That's in the fact that Bulgaria was a crucial link in the um, uh, Berlin to Baghdad railway at the same time. And Serbia became, you know, increasingly isolated. You know, Greece began to distance itself more from the Entente powers and would only enter the war reluctantly in 1917. Romania technically was an ally of the Triple Entente. So alone of the powers in the Balkans, we have um, Montenegro and Serbia. And from the Austrian point of view, we have a weakened Russian empire, which had backed down in 1908 and lost a war against a su supposedly weaker power in the form of Japan in 1904 and 1905. <laughs> yeah, a disastrous defeat. I mean, they, they uh, lost like their entire bloody navy, did they not? Well, two, um, the Far East fleet, and then when they chugged the Baltic fleet over there, eventually they got sort of swiped as well by Tojo. Mm. Yes, at, at the um, Battle of Tsushima. Exactly. Um, and they have, just, um, and they have um, political troubles at home, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. Just just before we move on, Apostle, like, I just want to mention this point because you, you sort of raised some really good points there about um, you know the, the Balkans and, and the, the various powers. Uh, I just want to say, too, that even within Greece, there's um, this obviously isn't about Greece, so I'm not going to hark on about it, but there's an interesting dynamic that occurs in Greece. And anyone who sort of read about the... Um, the Anatol Anatolia catastrophe would know about this, but there's a, a a a really interesting tug of war that occurs within the soul of Greece between the monarchists, because the the monarchy in Greece is sort of a, of an extension essentially of the Hollands or Zolans. They're a German uh, monarchy more or less, um, and then you have the Republicans under um, Ethiferios Venizelos, who um, so, have their so, own so, name. So, sorry, are you saying the Hohenzollerns were all Greece? No, it was the um... no, 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 no. They were related to them. I didn't say that they were. The... Yes, yes, it's the family of um, Holstein Gottlobsberg, and um, but, but they were related to the Hohenzollerns, weren't they? 
Yes, I mean, uh, in terms of trying to come up with a relationship, obviously they're related to the the King of Denmark, who married into I, every sort of notable um, every sort of notable yes. European house, including the Russian okay. royal family and the British royal family. So that, that's they my mistake. They're related to the, yeah. yeah, okay. So they weren't directly related to him. I thought they were, but they were, they were related to the Danes. Sorry, um, but but not either which way. The the monarchy in Greece were highly sympathetic to the Germans, um, and uh, one of the kings gets bitten by a monkey and he dies of. Um, uh, some kind of blood toxicity. There's a whole controversy that occurs in Greece, but the mo the, the monarchist faction is highly, highly Germani Germanophile. Well, Meanwhile, yeah, I mean, you the... had um, you had bloody I mean, Prince Philip. All of his sisters married SS officers later on, didn't well, they? They've always had their sympathies. <laughs> well, exactly. So there's um, so Greece itself is a bit of a hotbed for this um, this sort of uh, dynamic between you know, do they go uh, pro Entente and do they go uh, you know, pro uh, pro central powers? And and like Apostolic said. They quite reluctantly entered in 1917 on 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 the the side of the Entente, and just for those who didn't know, it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic that occurs in Greece. It's not really simple. It's actually quite multi-layered and quite complex, and it involves to the Megali idea in Constantinople. And yes, but I, I, that, that, that's too much. That's too much of a um a segue, sadly, for this. Yes, um, yes, it is for the stream. Yeah. And and again, you know, yeah. even this period is after the after the time period we're talking about. So I'm um, mm. getting back yes. onto the Austrian situation. So we set up the context for you know the situation in which Franz Ferdinand assassinated. As I mentioned, you know, you have the meeting between Franz Ferdinand and the Kaiser. We set up the role that Franz Ferdinand performed in the monarchy. He goes to Sarajevo in June of 1914, and together with his wife, he is assassinated by one of the um, members of the Italian Black Hand, sorry, uh, the um, Serbian Black Hand group, among many such assassination attempts at that time. But um, Gabriele Princip just happens to be the lucky um, marksman. He shoots both um, the um, both uh, Franz Ferdinand and uh, Sophie Chotek dead. And um, of course, the conventional historical narrative is that this led to the the revenge of the emperor against um, the Serbians. Of course, that isn't the case. Essentially, I mean, one of the one of the pivotal reasons as to why we see a, a fundamental shifting in power within Austria is that one of the cornerstones of Austrian decision making in the form of Franz Ferdinand, as I mentioned, he was crucial almost for Berchtold's rise for power, and even for von Herzendorf, ironically, rise for power, albeit he was wanting to dismiss Herzendorf in 1914 because Herzendorf was always advocating for a preventative war. And of course, the um, the von Volger was always advocating towards peace in 1914. So um, this you know, fundamentally changes the nature of the, the balance of power essentially within the decision-making process within Austria. And um, Berchtold begins to become, again, because he's essentially a scion, he has very little in the way of um, strong, consistent opinions. And it becomes more and more influenced by the need for a preventative war from Herzendorf and also from members more sort of they're called the young rebel group essentially within the Austrian foreign ministry uh, led by von Hoyos who again are advocating for this preventative war with Serbia and using the um, the assassination of uh, Franz Ferdinand as a pretext. I mean from F Franz Josef's point of view um, he, he didn't exactly welcome the the assassination but he wasn't he was essentially ambivalent towards it in many in many respects because now his um preferred nephew um grand nephew uh carl who had married again um uh, empress zita you know a couple of years before i'm uh, sorry um, uh, queen's uh, princess zita of bourbon palmer a few years before uh was now the intended heir and even though um Charles had again been part of this extended sort of group of the Belvedere Circle, advocating for imperial reform, and many of the people in that circle would later rise to power during the reign of um, Emperor Charles. Um, Emperor Charles you know, was essentially the the golden boy, essentially of the of the emperor, and so he welcomed the fact that um, you know, Charles would now essentially you know inherit the throne after Franz Josef died. However. It was not sort of readily apparent that um, there would you know, lead to war with Serbia, even though Hersendorf and the young rebels within the foreign ministry were advocating for it. You know, Franz Josef in particular had no interest in a um, in a war for revenge, and of course there was always the um, consideration to do with you know the, the the Russian agitation, and of course the German influence in this, because the Germans essentially their position was the the Kaiser illustrated this was the so-called blank check approach, which is you know we want a short preventative war in Serbia to eliminate the terrorist group which is associated with the interior ministry, i.e. the Black Hand, um, to reorientate Serbia you know, without annexations towards the central powers, leave Russia out of the um, 
at the equation of the Balkans and basically present German-Austrian influence in the Balkans as a fait accompli. That was basically the strategy emanating from Germany and Austria at that time, albeit the Austrians were still conscious of having their own independent foreign policy. And of course, as we all know, that didn't happen because contrary to all expectations, the French supported the Serbian position and buttressed the Russians in their opposition to allowing the Serbs to essentially be walked all over. And so after the sending of the ultimatum in August of 1914, the Russians begin to mobilize their army and that mobilization is extended on the 30th of August. And to my mind, that is the crucial factor that kicks off the First World War, a fundamental fatal miscalculation from the Austrians, believing that this war can be confined to the Balkans and can just exist as a preventative war to stop a potentially irredentist Serbia, uh, ends up erupting into one of the most horrific wars in world history. Mm. And so, um, what what would you put down the um the unexpected French French declaration to? What what would be your your prime reasons in your mind? Well, the French have um the the, the French have been sort of cozying up to um to Belgrade for, for for a long time now. And like I said, the French, I mentioned this on my stream with AA. The French had been investing significantly in um, Russian infrastructure, and of course, the idea that Russia should mobilize and attack Germany. Um, the French, from their point of view, there was this growing acceptance among because again, you know, the the, the key the key sort of decision maker during this time is uh, Poincaré, who is the French president and of course the French foreign minister, that um, France could only have any possibility of regaining its territories in Alsace-Lorraine so long as Russia was allied to France. And so mm -hmm. from my point of view, um, the Russians had a genuine grievance against the Germans and the Austrians, and therefore the French had a genuine pretext to essentially launch a war against Germany to acquire these territories, and they wouldn't potentially have another opportunity to offer that again. So I do believe the, the French motivations towards that were fundamentally hostile, because I mean, how else can you read that? They were directly at, they were directly escalating the conflict rather than de-escalating it and trying to find a mediation essentially for that policy. And it's very important to note that after the um, state visit by Poincaré to St. Petersburg in, um, in August of 1914, the Russians then begin a secret partial mobilization of their armed forces, which again is crucial mm. to German strategic thinking. So all of these elements um, continue a couple of weeks before the actual declaration of war. And of course, and like you say, with the mobilization, these are obviously considerations for the Germans, which are greatly influential regarding the um, the uh, the creation and the uh, the persistent tweaking of the Schlieffen plan, and uh, and uh, German the German mindset regarding well, if the war begins, how do we fight it? And those implications will sort of <laughs> have quite deep consequences, shall I say? Yes, and the Schlieffen plan, of course, proved to be effectively a failure and of course when yeah. when we talk about the chief and plan the, the strategic conception was the chief and plan was you know by the previous uh, chief of staff on chief but it was actually the multiple plan which had various additions which had been made over the yeah. previous years but the the fundamental and conception compromises that, too yes the fundamental idea was that the russians wouldn't have the um infrastructure to mobilize such a large army you know to, to fight the um to fight the Prussia, to fight the Germans essentially, allowing the Germans to attack on one front and then yeah, bring their forces to attack the second front. Bash the French first yeah. and then turn around. It, it, but, but of course, that would be a total disaster. Well, I was going to say, in some ways, it's the speed of the Russian mobilization uh, that sort of forces the Germans to uh, to reallocate forces east, which actually, or you could argue causes the sleeping plan to fail but that that's a that, that's a conversation we've well, otherwise this is, yes this is a conversation about austria yes. principally. so so yeah. back to the austrian situation um mm. von herzendorf of course is the chief of staff of the army and of course the the initial declaration of war you have the sending of the ultimatum the ultimatum is accepted with the exception of one point allowing for an investigation into the essentially a police investigation into serbia to find the culprits essentially the black hand group um you know you can say for various reasons you know one sort of preferential serbian argument you know in favor of that in favor of the serbian position is that this is a fundamental affront to serbian sovereignty the idea yes. that we're going to allow um, an independent country to investigate on our borders however one can legitimately say that the austrians could have uncovered the extent of the um, black hands involvement with the interior ministry at the same time and potentially humiliated Serbia as a result and given the Austrians more of a justification to invade as eventually they did. But of course the problem is now that what was meant to be a short decisive strike, especially in the in the mind of Berlin, has now become this um this the so-called July crisis, whereby um the empire now is, you know, essentially bringing in all these European powers against it. And, you know, Herzendorf 
you know, he, again, he's ridiculed on the one hand, and, and, and sorry, I do I mentioned in the chat that it was August 1914. No, it was July of 1914. I'm terribly sorry for repeatedly saying that, but I do, as you as you can tell, often get my dates muddled when I'm dealing with so many dates. But I should have got that um, crucial crucial month correct, and um, I do thoroughly apologise for oh, that. Oh, we'll and, let um, you off. Don't worry, we'll let you off. And I, 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 I am very <laughs> contrite. But um, the original Austrian plan was to you know, dedicate resources, obviously attacking Serbia, and to attack from Bosnia and for attack from the north and of course belgrade is just on the border with um austria so the idea is that belgrade would have fallen almost instantly um however now the russians are part of the strategic consideration um this this whole sort of um Hertzendorf plan is upended that and the fact that um the austrians also you know this is the worst time to fight a war because this is during the harv the harvesting leave for many of the um the austrian soldiers at the same time so the army is actually in a state of total disarray when it comes to the the mobilization of the armed forces and when the the actual plans are directed Herzendorf decides to wisely split the army in two and direct a preemptive strike against russia and a strike against serbia at the same time and the result is the serbians win in the south and of course the austrians decisively defeat the austrians sorry the russians decisively defeat the austrians at the battle of galicia and by middle of september of 1914 just a couple of weeks after the beginning of war in august um the austrians are not only defeated on the russian front but they're driven out over most of galicia and lodomeria and then we have this very long siege at the um the pivotal austrian fortress at um Presimitzel which falls in 1915. so the beginning of the war goes very very badly for the for the Austrians, and it's only the German successes, you know, the, the German victory at Tannenberg, and ultimately at the German victory at Mashurian Lakes, which pushes the the Russians essentially away from Austrian territory. And so the Russians occupy Galicia Lodomeria for almost the large part of a year before the Germans, in concert with the Austrians, begin to liberate the territory. Now this is the the end of the career of um of von Berchtold because von Berchtold has essentially, again, the, the sigh on his ears. He becomes the conduit for German interests, essentially. And the Germans and the Austrians and von Herzendorf now believe that, you know, a war with Italy has now become inevitable and you know they're not even privy to the um the secret negotiations in the secret negotiations in the treaty of london but um the german position is to preemptively avoid a war with the italians by the austrians giving territorial concessions to them of course from the austrian point of view this is you know from Herzendorf's plan, plan and the the austrian point of view that's ridiculous the idea that we would concede territory to a to technically an ally in order that they do not attack us during a war. And so um, the Berchtold is basically disgraced by this position and he's replaced by the much more sort of um, energetic and capable foreign minister von Bullion, who would later, you know, be recruited back, you know, by, by, by Blessed Charles, you know, just before the end of the war. And of course the prediction comes true and the Austrians do, sorry, the Italians do betray the Austrians, and they try and make it straight for Trieste, as you said um, earlier, um, Marcus. And of course, it turns into a complete disaster, and they're bogged down in the Alpine um, front for for many months. What's interesting, however, and is that um, I was just going to say, in the added twenty seven battles of the Isonzo later, you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so you can say that, uh, ironically, again, the the Austrians were able to gain some sort of um, military prestige at, at the expense of the Italians. And from 1915, during their second campaign against the Serbians, the Austrians defeat the Serbians and, uh, and, and occupy most of the country. Bulgaria, of course, joins the Central Powers, and um, Montenegro is occupied at the same time. So basically, the Balkans has been essentially occupied and the Eastern Front is now slowly pushing eastwards before again we have the massive reversal of the Russian Brusilov offensive. When it comes to um, the domestic situation, uh, von Sturg um, is the minister president of, Aus Austria, of Aus the Austrian half of the empire and he actually gets assassinated in 1916 in the eastern half of the empire in um, the Hungarian side of the empire. Uh, Istvan um, Tisa becomes effectively the Hungarian war leader. He even again in complete contrast to so many of the um you know, the various sort of prime ministers and leaders at that time he decides to place himself at the head of a regiment and command that regiment on the front line which is incredible if you think about it in terms of he's actually willing to brave the um <laughs> the, very, the effects of the front very stupid though isn't it <laughs> well no he survives and it, it it actually um increases his prestige at home essentially you know it's, it's a great sort of propaganda victory at mm. the same i mean he obviously doesn't die he's the result of you know several assassination attempts and he ultimately gets killed 
um, in 1918. And of course that precipitates a series of events in Hungary which are ultimately fatal to it. But um, what we're sort of presenting is a very mixed bag <laughs> For the for the Austro-Hungarians, as far as the military situation is concerned, and of course the the fundamental betrayal of the Italians and a growing dependence on the Germans militarily, whilst at the same time, uh, von Buren in particular is very much anxious to avoid you know the um, the empire basically becoming a vassal of the of the empire, and you see this especially with the the reign of Charles, who is you know constantly advocating for a separate peace negotiation to avoid you know Germany essentially you know. We already mentioned the economic relationship between Germany and Austria, how dependent Austria was economically mm -hmm. on Germany. Now it's becoming a military partnership, which is basically, again, increasingly subordinating the empire towards that of, you know, if not a, if not a um, vassal nation, then very much a second a second rate ally. Yeah. And when I mean, you see, um, I mean, m much of the food as well that's grown um, is getting sent to Germany as well, is it not? Um, what do you mean? Sorry. In the sort of Slavic places and 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 um, along the Danube in the in in Hungary, um, much of the food and and much of the grain is being moved into Germany, and I think this is the cause of some dissatisfaction of, um, amongst the sort of eastern half of the empire as well. Well, no. Um, when we talk about uh, east of, I mean, one of the most infamous aspects of Teaser's ministry is that um, he would stockpile food resources because Hungary was one of the great food producing regions of Europe and as a result the Germans were left without food but also the Austrian half of the empire was left without food and so what you're basically seeing is that during the war Hungary is advocating its own war effort essentially and it's even advocating its own foreign policy and it's preventing food from being circulated as again to areas which are nominally part of the empire, again, it's a power move to weaken the Austrians vis-a-vis -vis the Hungarians. And again, forgive me, I, I I don't know where I read that, but but that that makes that makes a lot more sense as a sort of power play for independence, I suppose. Make the most of the situation. Yes, exactly. And um, yes, I think obviously this this gets us to the 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 end of this discussion, um, which is the sorry. Actually, just oh, may I just say something just quickly. Well, just because you flicked over the map, I just want to say that it's worth mentioning too that the Serbian army actually acquitted itself extremely well in the first um, year and a half of the war. And yes, yes, it, I it mentioned only... that how they were victorious in 1914. Yeah, and, and and with the the Bulgarians sort of coming in and hitting them on the flank um, in 1915, they actually um, the, a, a large portion of the Serbian army actually manages to withdraw itself south. And um and and to the coastline or certainly parts of it and it's sort of considered something of a miracle even though they suffer terrible attrition in the winter um, crossing of the Montenegrin mountains um, the Serbian armies and certainly elements of it sort of remain intact and sort of end up fighting on elsewhere in the war um, and it sort of becomes a bit of a focal point of Serbian folklore you know going forward into the um into the post-war uh, you know years. Yes, and these soldiers will play a pivotal role in the collapse of the um, mm -hmm. Austro-Hungarian Empire yes. when we have the great advance from the south combined with the French yes. army. But again, that's yeah. a discussion for a different time. Um, the last sort of um, major sort of um, military development before the death of Franz Josef is, of course, we're mentioning this um, precarious situation with with another nominal ally in the form of Romania. Well, after the great success of the Russian Brusilov offensive, um, in which you know, the German advance is essentially halted and the Austrians are you know, decisively defeated in Galicia Lodomeria, albeit it doesn't lead to the same occupation as with the original battle. Um, the Romanians use that as an impetus to switch sides and join with the Russians and um, invade Transylvania to try and again take over those ethnically Romanian regions. Which again leads to another front in which the Austrians have to fight, albeit you know, the Austrians would briefly win and occupy most of um, Romania. And in the end of 1916, Franz Josef finally dies and is, you know, succeeded by his um his grand nephew Karl, and um this to me, I mean, is is really the end of the epoch because when we have the the reign of Karl, which I, I dedicated an entire episode with with um uh, Charles Coulomb, uh, we're talking about the the last essentially hurrah for the empire to try and retain its independence to constitutionally reform itself all the while there are nations you know surrounding it especially with the american entry into the war who are trying to disintegrate it but i think it, it should be noticed and no noted that um yeah really with the with the end of franz Josef, i do sort of believe it's the it's the end of the epoch i mean this is a man who um who, who sort of ascended to deal with the 1848 revolutions and um tragically he dies you know in the midst of a conflict that you know he, he arose in a situation in which the empire um potentially could have you know dissolved itself and you know 
been dismembered, you know, as part of a, um, a democratic Germany and a, um, a democratic Hungary. And now he's in a situation where the empire is essentially on its death is again, albeit one consolation for him is that he does not live to see the final dissolution of his empire. And um, yes, I think that's that, that's a good, unless anyone has anything else to say, a good place to to leave the discussion because you know it, the next sort of series of videos we're going to do on this topic will go into all these sort of individual compartments, the um, the composite nations of the empire, and uh, evaluate them without essentially this this focus on on the greater events of the empire. The purpose of these first two videos, the first one of course dealing with the, the Habsburg monarchy, you know, from the creation of such a thing until um, the defeat of Königgrätz in 1866 in this video, is just to give you a broad overview of the overarching political structure and the major events before we then move into the, um, you can see more particular aspects of our historical analysis. Um, I, there's probably two things I might just quickly mention if that's okay. Um, yeah, sure. One is one is because uh, I dare not let down the Iron Duke, the infamous Iron Duke, and I, I mean I'm not going to go into detail of the Battle of Lissa. I mean, I we probably should have covered it in the previous stream, and I didn't realize it, and also I don't know a lot about it. But um, but for Iron Duke's sake, I actually had a bit of a bit of a look, and for those who are interested, it, it occurred in the Adriatic, um, in the te in the War of uh, 1866, and it's actually one of the the few naval battles where you actually have a combination of the age of sail and the age of um steam and you have ironclads and ship of the line fighting each other and uh even though the austrians are outnumbered um uh, 26 ships to 32 the austrians actually uh come out on top and uh it's actually sort of a last hurrah for the um for the uh, austrian uh navy because that, as people know after world war one the austrians do lose their access to the sea and um and so it, the Austrians don't have a navy following World War One, um, even though Miklos, Miklos Horthy, um, who was Hungarian, would later be, become the the essentially the um, regent of Hungary. Um, he himself was actually an admiral in the Austrian uh, 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 admiralty. Uh, and secondly, oh sorry, what was that? Well, just you to compound, you, sorry, just to compound your point, Furious. Um, you mentioned the Battle of Lisa, a unexpected Austrian victory against the Italians. Well, of course, yes. in the First World War, this is repeated, and which Haughty himself wins the decisive victory, a victory at the Straits of Otranto in yes. 1917, and defeats again the the larger Italian fleet buttressed by you know the, the French and the and the English. So mm. again, it, it's rather interesting. Again, we don't associate Austria as you know representing this this great naval power. In fact, I remember I was having an argument on. Twitter was somebody, you know, this, this is ridiculous, the idea of <laughs> Austria having a capable navy. Well, not only did Austria have a capable yeah. navy, not only was it a focal point of um, the Austrian expansion into the Balkans, you know, as part of this new sort of post Andalashi um, strategic situation, but they were mm. able to defeat the supposed, you know, nation with a great naval tradition, you know, harkening back thousands of years. The Italians course, in yeah. two decisive military engagements, one during the mm. original um, war in 1866 at the Battle of Lisa, and of course the, the pivotal battle in the Adriatic at the at the Strait of the Tranto. Yeah, of course. Um, and uh, and also, um, as would happen after the war too, when, uh, you know, post Angelos as well, the Germans had some of an interest in, in retaining some of that uh, Austrian, um, uh, what would you call it, sort of competence in naval affairs and sort of integrate it into the Kriegsmarine. Um, secondly, the other small point I wanted to raise too was because uh, you mentioned very briefly in the, on the east front of World War One the Brusilov Offensive. And uh, the Brusilov Offensive is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's actually one of the most um, lethal offensives in military history. It's actually extremely well executed. And, and often the people have a really simplistic um, understanding of the of the Russian armed forces. And I mean, I'm not going to say that the Russians um, in World War One were a massively sophisticated military, but um, Brusilov himself had some quite amazing and groundbreaking ideas. And, and for those who are inter interested in sort of infantry tactics of, of, of early modern history um there's sort of three schools of um sort of infiltration tactics that sort of develops um one is a a german school uh, and i can't actually remember the general who masterminds it but um we sort of see this uh, play out in, on the uh, west front of 1918 with the um the kaiserschlacht offensive the summer offensive with the the german uh, Schlosstruppe. Uh, where they use sort of you know bundle grenades and flamethrowers and they use small units to infiltrate the line and sort of break through on a larger scale uh Brusilov, Brusilov actually does this a little bit earlier in a different fashion but um Brusilov was sort of uh, uh fundamental in the in, in these early infiltration tactics small unit tactics um what would be called sort of stormtroop tactics and he used them to great effect against the austrians and 
And I mean, if you look at the casualty uh, list of the of the Brusilov offensive of 1916, the Russian um, casualties were sort of sizable. Um, if you sort of include uh, dead and wounded uh, in the hundreds of thousands, sort of nearing a million, but um, uh, the the Austrians themselves lost in the order of 600,000. Oh, sorry, the Germans lost in the order of 600,000, and the Austrians um, nearly a million. There themselves, are, the Russians are sort of killing at a rate of 50% um, above their own losses. So that's sort of indicative of how effective these tactics were, and sort of they would become foundational to infantry combat um, well, following World well, War One and you going into World War II. You could call them effective, but look what happened to the Russians at the end of that war. Yeah, well, before, right we, before, we, before we go too much on a tangent, um, I, I do just want to illustrate one point is that, you know, circles back to Austria-Hungary. Is to anyone who thinks that, you know, Austria-Hungary is a moribund empire, and of course, you know, the, the proverbial joke that the the Austrians were used as a warfare, and of course, the, the thing we've been, been positioning is that Austria's military history is, of course, incredibly checkered, and the fact um, the the situation with um, the Italian war, the, the second Italian war of independence, is of course, muted by the fact that France had allied with the Piedmontese. In the case of the um, the Prussian War of um, 1866, the Prussians were the foremost military power in Europe at that time, were able to defeat yeah. all of its competitors. But um, in this war, we're talking about a world war in which Austria is fighting on all fronts, save one in the north uh, against Germany, albeit it's fighting a diplomatic front. Something I failed to mention is that von Buren, of course, was a incredibly um, focused on, you know, again, the Polish situation. Essentially, Polish Poland had been um, liberated from um, Russian control by the end of 1915. And, the, of course, what was the situation with, with um, an independent Poland, potentially? Of course, the Prussians had no interest in annexing this territory because they already had enough issues with their own um, Polish population within their own territory. So the German situation was, you know, we want Congress Poland to become an independent Polish state as a German client. The Austrian position is, well, we have Galicia Lodomeria. We have a very loyal Polish aristocracy in Krakow, in Lemburg. So let us annex Congress Poland to Austria-Hungary, and that'll be the third kingdom within the empire. Let's abandon this South Slav conception. We'll um, take Galicia Lodomeria and we'll make a Polish kingdom and make it Poland, Hungary, and um, Austria at the same time. So, you know, right towards the end, when we're talking about, you know, um, solutions to try and, you know, fundamentally change the nature of monarchy and accommodate its various nationalities and peoples. Um, von Buren was advocating this you know, right towards the, um, and again, the Austrians were sort of advocating this right before it became clear that they were, you know, nothing more than sort of military surrogates, the Germans, by 1918. But um, that should indicate to you again how um, the, the Austrians, this wasn't a moribund empire. You know, th these, these conceptions of imperial reform and, you know, um, and again, even with the the German the Germans as allies, you know the Austrians were able to routinely you know produce more and more troops. I mean the the effect of Hertzendorf's you know disasters in the in the early sort of 1914 1915 were that it deprived the Austrians of a you know an elite officer corps or also a bilingual officer corps to deal with the fact you had so many different languages within you know, the various ethnic groups of the empire, you know, whether it be Galicians, whether it be Slovenians, whether it be Croatians, whether it be Hungarians, whether it be Slovaks, etc. Um, the sad thing about the early parts of the war is that most of this um, officer corps is wiped out by the, you, you can say, the essential aggressiveness of the Austrian army. And of course, von Hutzendorf is one of the key um, you know, strategists arguing for the best form of defense attack. And of course, you know, he's also quite um, unscrupulous in the fact that when his plans, you know, end up in total disaster, he will always claim, well, I'm simply the, you know, the the maker of the plans. I don't execute them, so I can't bear any of the responsibility. <laughs> I, I'm more of the big picture sort of guy. <laughs> yes, precisely. But but that, that, that should illustrate, though, the fact that despite the fact that the Austrian Empire is um, ethnically divided, it is able to continually rejuvenate and, you know, recruit more soldiers again to fight in a war which is essentially, you know, the, the war that'll end up in its you know, total destruction, a war to the finish. And um, it is able to routinely put out more soldiers. And despite, you know, the the vast loss of life, as you mentioned there at um, the Brusilov offensive, the Austrians are still able to put more men into the Eastern Front. And ultimately, the Austrians and the Germans will defeat the Russians in the Eastern Front. And like in the Italian Front, the Austrians are able to hold on to the Italian Front until, you know, basically Austrian morale breaks down at the end of 1918. And um, the only sort of notable exception to this is the um, the decisive Salonika campaign involving, you know, Serb, Greek and um, French troops, um, right again, right at the end of the war. So 
yeah, again, that's more of a topic. Yeah. Yes, so we're, we're alluding to things about the disintegration, but nevertheless, this isn't a disintegration stream, so I'll, I'll save no. that for another time. Just, just, to, just to very briefly briefly buttress your point, I mean, it's not just that they hold Italians too. I mean, let's not forget that Austrian forces are occupying large parts of Veneto and, yes, exactly, um, yeah. and, and have almost broken into Lombardy and actually hold those positions for years on end. Um, yes, exactly. And, and, and essentially, uh, for those who are interested, uh, Luigi Cardona basically ruins his reputation as the Italian general commanding the forces on the northern front. Um, with a, a, a lot of people joke about, you know, the, the 47 battles of the Asonzo, but, you know, th these Italian offensives against the Austrians are largely futile and, and uh, are responsible for a massive loss of life. And, um, you know, uh, if we get down this stream uh, further along uh, in time, who knows, but um, uh, one, um, one Benito Mussolini is actually a veteran um in 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 this uh in this campaign and in fact um the explore experience does um have a how should we say a, a world changing effect later on but um th th this event and these series of battles have are of massive consequence to the italian psyche and the austrians equip 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 themselves with um a high degree of competence and effectiveness yes yeah, so yeah, don't to, so sorry Columba. I, I was just going to say it leads to you know a huge a huge you know, wave of dissatisfaction with the sort of national government in Italy and a desire for something yeah. else, which which doesn't come. But that, but that again is moving on yeah. to an entirely indeed, different stream. Indeed. So we'll we'll indeed. avoid going down that route and we'll go on the super chats if that's all right. Because I think we we've summarised. You know, yes. Apparently they fixed the um, the super chat issue. So yes, they they fixed it um, last week, and apparently AA is claiming um, <laughs> claiming personal, responsibility. Personal for that. responsibility. Yeah. Yes. So um, modern guru for ten US dollars, even as a Lutheran, I always have open mind with you guys you do an amazing job on here and i love you for it youtube needs more channels like am columba furious and the others thank you so much well Thanks, thank buddy. you very much um modern guru and of course um I, I will say that i have no interest in you know just presenting a strictly sort of catholic view i mean i am a catholic it does inform my understanding of the world but i try and present it as objectively as i i can within that viewpoint and um if, if you're a Lutheran and you're able to enjoy that, that, that's wonderful, even though we do occasionally have a bit of Reformation bashing on this channel. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll let off the Lutherans, though. They're not the but worst. It's all, but it's all in, it's all in good, good spirit and it's all sporting, you know. Indeed. Yes, we're, we're a cumanist at heart. Um, Forst Metternich for 10 US dollars. Thank you very much. Is anyone on the stream familiar with John Biggin's Otto Ploschka novels, where they set in the final decade of Austria-Hungary? They really helped spur my interest in the empire. Yes, I believed um, there was a similar super chat on the Charles Coulon novels. And again, I, when sort of forming my sort of butchers, my sort of formative interest in Austria-Hungary, I tend to read these things at university and I tend to forget all about them, <laughs> especially I'm not, a, I'm not a sort of avid fiction reader, sadly. So I, I really got to, got, to, got to get around and um, reading more of these novels again. I mean, I've never read, say, for example, Kafka. And a lot of people will say, oh, Kafka is, you know, my, my intellectual interest in bohemian civilization at the time. You know. No, 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 I've, I've never actually read Kafka, so I'm a bit of a philistine when it comes yes. to that. It, it um, seems like much of the sort of culture of that era has become just a sort of cipher for students wanting to show off. I mean, I mean, Klimt especially, Gustav Klimt. So many students seem to suddenly have artworks of Gustav Klimt and nobody can well, tell I, the first thing about him. Yes, well, I say that. Well, um, we're going to be trying to offer some of the um, the cultural innovations produced in the Austrian Empire in our um, our discussion next week. So we'll, well, we'll hopefully I can be more useful on that one. I can certainly speak to the cultural life in Vienna, but um, yes, when we come to the nebulous politics here, um, I don't I don't think I don't think I've acquitted myself as well. Uh, no, you've been absolutely wonderful, Columbo. Don't say that. Um, Bolero for three nine three for nine ninety nine US dollars. Thank you very much. Just marking that Apostolic Majesty said he didn't remember something. Never heard him not know something. Learning so much. Well. Uh, I have to say, Bolero 393, that I'm often at pains to say when I forget something. It's often become a meme, actually, of um, <laughs> AM forgetting something. So um, um, that may be the first time you've heard it, Bolero, but um, it, it's a constant event. And sadly, I'm incredibly fallible. And I, I, I admit I've made mistakes on the stream and I try and call them out whenever I'm, I'm aware of them. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think you need to continue to cultivate this aura of of total total knowledge. You know, it will uh, it will come in handy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not I'm not vain enough. I don't think to um carry that <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, Darth Kilhoon for five U.S. dollars. Uh, Franz Ferdinand's letters to Kaiser Wilhelm II is alarming of how he knew 
who is going to be assassinated in his words by a Masonic plot. Yes, that alludes to one aspect of Franz Ferdinand, which we didn't talk about, which is the fact that Franz Ferdinand was above everything else, a devout Roman Catholic. And he believed that, you know, the throne and altar, the unification of, you know, the, the traditional standard of the church combined with the army and the law and the, combined with the monarchy and the loyalty of the army was the, the crucial basis of um, the longevity of the monarchy. And this is one of the reasons why Franz Josef tolerated Franz Ferdinand, even though he was not on familiar terms with him, is that broadly speaking, with the exception of his various um, constitutional antics, you know, his Belvedere Circle Reformist groups, his ideas for, you know, reforming Austria onto a model, you know, based on, you know, ethnic lines or, you know, trialism, etc., is that, um, he was fundamentally um, a defender of the Habsburg institutions, of, of, uh, fundamentally a defender of the dynasty, the army, and the Catholic Church. And in terms of um, a Masonic plot, I mean, <laughs> uh, I I think it's fair to say that um, the the Black Hand group was, I mean, many of them were sort of devoutly orthodox, and this alludes to the fact that um, this goes back to this this old sort of you know Russian al allied conception of the, the defense of the orthodox populations in the Ottoman Empire, and just extending that to the orthodox populations in Austria Hungary. Because when um, we have the brief occupation of Galicia Lodomeria, um, when Nicholas II visits this area, he declares that um, this area has linguistically and ethnically and religiously always been a part of the conception of Russia and so in that sense Russia is you can say making making a stand and saying that we do not even recognize the 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 historical entities you know in terms of Galicia Lodomeria this territory had been you know joined with Austria since 1772 so the fact that the Tsar would say something I think represents a complete contempt for Austria as existing as a nation state and that Russia is prepared to buttress this idea of pan-slavism and this um, orthodox protection of everywhere and of course many of the plans involving you know the post-war situation with Austria-Hungary involve um you know say for example severing Bohemia and Moravia and forming a personal union with the Tsar in addition to severing the southern Slav lands and allying them with Serbia so the Russian plans towards Austria-Hungary were very bellicose and of course as we continually mentioned um in great power consideration Austria-Hungary was key to preventing Russian domination and by that extension German domination over the Balkans and over Central Europe and so when uh, the fact that Russian interest is becoming just you know dissolve Austria-Hungary we have no consideration for it we might leave you know a, a German state in Austria a German state in Hungary you know tied together under the Habsburg dynasty but everything else will be dismembered I think it comes as no surprise given the how um aggressive Russia's aims were in terms of creating this um consolidated influence throughout the Balkans and the remnants of the um Ottoman Empire and that Austria was always the um bulwark against that Indeed. so John Boy for 10 euros Good arrived John a bit Boy. Arrived a bit late for this one, but we'll catch up tomorrow. Thank you to AM and Columbra Marcus. Well, what I tend to do when listening to streams is watch them on two times speed, so um to try and catch up. But um, <laughs> well, um, not all of us are are you know sort of godlike autodidacts. I am okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I only listen to my streams on four times speed. <laughs> Just, I beam it into my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, Shay Ragnarsson for five pounds just send, sent a thumbs up. Uh, well, thank you, um, Shay Ragnarsson. Uh, do send a question next time, but more than happy to answer it. Uh, Votan005 for five US dollars. Cheers. Well, thank you very much, Votan005. Uh, Judge Caligula Bushman for five euros says, one time AM couldn't remember who the 1906 Luxembourgish Minister of Agriculture was, and one time he still hates himself for it. Um, <laughs> I don't recall that specific incident, Judge Caligula Bushman, but I do um, hate myself for not remembering all these historical details because it means I have to. Um, I, I'm leaving a um, an unsatisfactory and flawed product for all of my dear <laughs> listeners to um, to indulge on. So um, yeah, that yes, will the, always irritate me. The odd occasion that someone on this panel just gets beat. It's like actually, funny enough, I, I think um, it was last week. I, I caught myself. Um, uh, I made a reference. It might be a few streams ago where I was talking about. Um, oh no, I think it might have been with perhaps. Oh no, it was with Prudentialist, and I got um, Domitian and Diocletian mixed up. So we all, we all, we all make these mistakes. You know? How dare you? Fatal error. You must. How dare you? <laughs> well, re remember, I'm Roman. Like, you know, it's unforgivable for me. Like, I have to just like assemble my own cross now, and you know, just. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Domitian's basically your uncle. So. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> Destroyed. 
Wonderful. So um, unless do we have a super chat from D's bit of rough today? <laughs> no. Dis disappointed. Come on. Oh no. Anyway, um, so that's it for the super chats. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, does anyone have anything they want to shill before we um, get out of here? Columba, you're going to the event on Friday, I, uh, aren't you? To be the um, the emissary of the pasta liquors at, at the event. Nice. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be our envoy, our diplomatic envoy, <laughs> um, and and hopefully hopefully I'll have the stamina for the stream on Monday. Um, yes, you'll, you'll be that, you'll be my um, you'll be my Andarashi to my Kosov. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, how quaint. <laughs> we we stand. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I need to let myself <laughs> out. <laughs> Marcus, um, uh, I think in uh, I think it's Wednesday, um, so sort of European time. I will be. I actually just firm this up just before the stream started. I'm going to be discussing uh, the infinitely interesting subject of Australian agriculture with um. Mr. Patriarch on his channel. Um, it's for those who did catch AA stream uh, unpopular opinions when I was on about a month ago and I sort of spoke about um, the erosion of uh, Australian sovereignty in the field of, of agriculture. Um, it sort of is going to stem sort of from that discussion that we had on the panel um, regarding sort of uh, this is probably more broader sort of touch on climate or touch on trade touch on a bit of uh, heuristicity of, of agriculture in Australia because, I mean, for those who don't know, it's a really, really important part of the Australian psyche and uh, of the uh, of, of Australian sort of mythos and folklore, uh, despite only being a, a nation of a couple hundred years old. Um, yeah, that's about it. I suppose, um, as for the rest of us, we're just plugging along with uh, apostolic good work. So, yeah, buckle up for, for what is to come, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Right, wonderful. Um, just for you know, channel news. Of course, there is a heterodox episode on Wednesday, which will be going over uh, Tsar Nicholas II, which will round off our Fall of Eagle series. Um, hopefully, it'll be interesting and depressing. That's with um, Bodade or History Bro, who's on the Lotus Eaters. So um, do check Indeed. that one out. Um, other than that, um, thank you all very much all my patrons who you can see here. Um, if anyone has any interest in contributing to the channel through subscribe start, there is a link in the description. Other than that, please like, share and comment on this video. It really helps the channel out. Thank you to my wonderful guests and good night. Good night, everyone.